Hi listeners, Rob Woodland here, the usual host of the 80,000 Hours podcast. Today's episode is pretty different from our usual podcasts, uh, which generally focus on people's research or other work that they're doing to try to solve the world's most pressing problems. This episode is a lot more personal. Kieran Harris, the producer of the show, uh, interviewed our colleague Howie Lempel about how mental illness has affected his life and career. And I think it's really one of the most remarkable and unique pieces of content that 80,000 Hours has ever produced. Mental illness is one of the things that's most likely to trip up people uh, who are trying to have a large social impact with their career, or just have a flourishing career in general. So we think this could plausibly be one of the most impactful episodes of this show as well. The first half of the conversation is a searingly honest account of Howie's life story, including losing a job he loved due to a depressed episode, uh, what it was like to be basically out of commission for over a year, how he ultimately got back on his feet, uh, and the things that he still struggles with today. The second half covers Howie's advice for listeners. Conventional wisdom on mental health can be really focused on cultivating grit and willpower, you know, uh, telling depressed people that the virtuous thing to do is to start exercising and improve their diet, get their sleep in check, and just generally fix all of their problems before turning to therapy or medication uh, as some sort of last resort. Howie tries his best to be a corrective to this potentially quite harmful attitude uh, and focuses really pragmatically on what actually matters, which is doing whatever you can to actually get better. Howie and Kieran treated this recording basically like a private conversation, uh, with the understanding that it might well have been too sensitive to release. But after passing it to some people and getting some really positive feedback, uh, they've decided to share it with the world. Here's uh, three quotes from some early reviewers. Uh, First, I think there's a big difference between admitting you have depression or seeing a psych uh, and giving a warts and all account of a major depressive episode like Howie does in this episode. Uh, His description was relatable and really inspiring. Someone else who works on mental health issues said, uh, this episode is perhaps the most vivid and tangible example of what it is like to experience psychological distress that I've ever encountered. Even though the content of Howie and Kieran's discussion was serious, I thought they both managed to converse about it in an approachable and not overly somber way. Finally, another reviewer said, I found Howie's reflections on what is actually going on in his head when he engages in negative self-talk to be considerably more illuminating than anything that I've heard from my therapist. So here at 80,000 Hours, we hope that this episode will... First off, help people realize that they have a shot at making a difference in the future, even if they're experiencing or have experienced in the past mental health issues, self-doubt, imposter syndrome, or or whatever other personal obstacles. And secondly, give insight into what it's like in the head uh, of at least one person with depression, anxiety, and imposter syndrome, uh, including the specific thought patterns they experience on typical days, uh, as well as more extreme days. In addition to that being interesting in its own right, uh, this might make it easier for people to understand the experiences of family members, uh, friends, uh, and colleagues, and also know how to react more helpfully. Several early listeners have even made specific behavioral changes uh, due to listening to this episode, uh, including people who generally otherwise have good mental health, but were convinced it's well worth the low cost uh, of setting up a plan in case they, they do have some problems in future. So we think this episode can be valuable for people who've experienced mental health problems in the past or might in future. Uh, People who've had troubles with stress, anxiety, uh, low mood or low self-esteem, even if those experiences aren't best described as mental illness. And also people who've never experienced those problems, but want to learn about what it's like so they can better relate to and help out uh, family, friends and colleagues. In other words, we think this episode could be worth listening to for almost everybody. First off though, just a heads up that this conversation gets pretty intense at times uh, and includes some references to self-harm and suicidal thoughts. If you don't want to hear the most intense section, you can skip the chapter called Disaster. That's between 44 and 57 minutes in. And if you'd rather avoid uh, almost all of those references, uh, you could skip straight to the chapter called 80,000 Hours. That's about one hour and 11 minutes in. If you're feeling suicidal or have thoughts about harming yourself right now, uh, there are suicide hotlines at National Suicide Prevention Lifeline in the US uh, and Samaritans in the UK. You can find links and phone numbers to those in the show notes for this episode. Oh, and uh, Howie's role has changed since this episode was recorded. Uh, He is now Chief of Staff at 80,000 Hours. All right, without further ado, here's Howie and Kieran. I am here with Howie. Thanks for doing this. No problem. So you're currently our strategy advisor at 80,000 Hours, and in your role, you advise the CEO and program leads on major decisions. You write content for our website, you host podcasts, and you do a bunch of other important things. You used to work on white-collar crime at Manhattan DA's office and on U.S. economic policy as a research assistant at the Brookings Institution. After that, you went to Yale Law for two years, the top law school in the U.S., where you spent your summers as a public defender in Louisiana and suing prisons with poor conditions at the ACLU. 
and you left Yale Law to be one of the first staff working full-time at a $10 billion foundation. That's the Open Philanthropy Project. As the first program officer for Global Catastrophic Risks, you helped to found program areas on potential risks from advanced AI and biosecurity and pandemic preparedness, as well as making millions of dollars in grants. So to almost everyone in the audience, that's an intimidatingly impressive list of things. So uh, is it safe to say that your life has been smooth sailing so far? Um, Smooth sailing would be uh, (laughs) pushing it a bit. Um, There have definitely been some ups and some big downs. So I guess when you read my bio off like that, it sounds pretty good. But I guess as we will talk about, there are some mental health related gaps in there also, as well as some like, you know, like pretty rough periods, personally and professionally, during times where like, where like the resume line seems perfectly fine. So this isn't going to be as carefully structured as a lot of the ADK podcasts are, but broadly, I thought we'd start with your backstory and some of your current personal challenges, and then get into some concrete advice, and finally, chat a bit about the effect of altruism community and mental health. Does that sound good? That sounds good to me. All right, uh, let's dive in. Can you tell us about your first experience with severe depression? Yeah, so there are sort of like two episodes that I sort of think of as contenders for my first experience. So I guess my sophomore year in college, I did this little program, this interdisciplinary social studies program that was known for sort of having a particularly intense sophomore year. And it was ungraded, which actually made me a good student for the first time in my life because I just had like a bad attitude about the like status competition of like getting grades. And so it was just sort of like self-undermining and didn't try. And then all of a sudden where it was like, well, do I want to learn a lot or not? It was like, yes. And I think I'm probably obligated to also. And started just like working incredible amounts and like basically unhealthy amounts. So like, what does that mean? How much is unhealthy? I think there was a period of a few months where I was probably like six nights a week sleeping for like four hours a night and then just not sleeping on the other night. We had a paper due once a week. And so on that night, I would just not sleep. There was a uh, inappropriate amount of caffeine that I was using. So it also was the most productive time in my life. Up until that point, my anxiety was like not close to as bad as it is now. So I was like able to do that. I sort of up until that point basically did all the work that I ever did, like sort of right up at the deadline. And so we'd sort of procrastinate by just like trying to learn tons of stuff all week and then pull an all-nighter at the end of the week and like write a paper on it. And so, yeah, so I was actually like happy for like most of that period in my life, but I don't know, I was like pushing myself a lot. And then I went home for, I guess first when I went home for winter break, I had like a rough, a rough stretch there. And then when the year ended and I spent the summer back uh, in the New York suburbs where I grew up, I think that's like an environment that like is bad for me in general. But I also think the sort of contrast between This sort of lifestyle where I sort of had one very clear, structured goal. It was like, here are your classes. This is the thing that you were trying to succeed at. Almost like a totalizing way, just putting everything into that. To like running like a day camp, because I don't know what to do with my summer. Like hanging out and like killing time until school starts. Just sort of had my first real rough spot that summer. Like the first thing I would call like a real like clinically depressed episode. Sort of like started then. And what what did you do? Like what was your response? Basically didn't respond to it at all. So what was that like? So it's now, this is now like 15 years ago. So memory is not 100% anymore. And I don't, I can't remember if I would have used the, yeah, I think I would have used the word depressed at the time to describe what was going on. But I was just really down. And when I get down, it's largely like a angry sort of self-hating type of thing in combination with like a lack of energy. So I was like, just like very miserable. And I think I had a view of depression at the time where I think I like basically thought that it was instrumentally useful. And so I did literally nothing about it at all. So a lot of the way my depression works is I will feel guilty about something or other I did. At the time, it had a lot to do with like spending money on myself when like I thought I ought to be giving it away and just sort of like really beating myself up over that, but also about like I don't know, like minor interactions, I fuck up like social interactions and the people around me and like that kind of thing too. And then just sort of reacting in a way that's really disproportionate. That's something I sort of 
do in general, and then have these stretches that are more like depressed episodes where that just sort of like goes into overdrive and has like positive feedback loops and sort of just gets much more extreme. So yeah, so the answer is I did nothing about it because I was like, oh, well, I guess this is an incentive to like do the right thing. Also, I was just like 19 and like didn't really like know how one like goes about like handling. I guess I that's not quite true. I helped a lot of friends through mental illness at that point, but like, I don't know, wasn't being like thoughtful about it didn't even seem like an option. Like, do I do something about this? I just sort of waited it out. And it was definitely a depressed episode. It was not as severe as some of the things that we'll talk about later. I was able to function for the whole time. And so it just sort of was plausible to like wait it out. And I like waited it out. My environment changed when the summer ended. I went back to college. I like liked college a lot and sort of let it run its course. I guess the one thing that did happen, which I actually think is probably pretty common, that was in the direction of doing something about it, is I think... Over the course of college, there were probably maybe like two to three times where I signed up for like an intake session at the mental health clinic to see a therapist. I maybe went to intake once. I think I did. Yeah, I think I went once. The other two times I like canceled two or three days later. And when I did do the intake, I like canceled after that. And it was like some sort of a thing where like I'd be feeling really bad at some point, get myself to the threshold of like making an appointment, even though mental health care just like felt scary. And then like when I was feeling a bit better and like whatever the acute thing was gone a few days later, I would just cancel it. And I actually think that this is super common. And like most people do not end up getting mental health treatment the first time that they like make a decision to get mental health treatment. So I don't know, I guess people should both know that if that's a thing that you've done, that's a thing that like. I don't know, I guess I've done too. I think a lot of other people do it too. And also, it may not feel, once you're doing better, like you need the treatment anymore. But I don't know, in my opinion, like a lot of mental health care, it's sort of like a, oh, it's like a marathon, not a race. And so it's hard to motivate yourself to like go do something while you're feeling better. But I don't know, I'll make a pitch for like doing that anyway. So you were 19 when this happened? About, I guess I was, it would have been between my sophomore and junior years in college. So I guess I probably would have been 20, something like that. Right. And then how old were you on the, when the next major experience came around? Yeah, so the next one that was really bad, actually much more severe, was, so it would have been 2012. So it's probably like about 26 years old when I was in law school. And so it was towards the end of my first year in law school, and in the meantime, I had like, I, don't know, I was like, definitely like, if I'm not having a depressed episode, I'm like a depressed person and like an anxious person. I'm sort of a distinction that I like to draw. So like my like set point, my mood is just low on average. I like beat myself up too much on average. I have like months where it gets worse. They're like, I'm like moderate depressed episodes or something. And there are these like severe things that just felt like super qualitatively different. So like, I knew that I was a person that like had some like mental health problems going on but hadn't had anything that was like, it just maybe like non-functional. And so in law school, had a period of time, maybe like halfway through my first year, a little bit more than halfway through my first year, where I started to get a little bit more depressed, a little bit more anxious. I don't really know why. I think it was like a bit of like, oh shit, being a lawyer requires some public speaking. I'm like terrible at public speaking. Now I have to face that. That sucks. Like I shake in front of even like a small audience and like just very noticeable and unmistakable. I have like some horror stories from like high school about this. Um, it just like actually was bad. So it was like a little bit of having to like do that and confront that. It was a little bit of just, I am not academically interested in the law. I think it can be like practically useful, but it's just like not interested in my classes. And yeah, so for whatever reason, I was like feeling anxious, feeling like a bit depressed. And it started to take like a real toll on my romantic relationship at the time. I was at Yale, which is in Connecticut. My partner at the time was in Boston, which is like a two and a half hour, three hour bus ride away. So we're able to sort of see each other every weekend. And it turns out that like when you wake up every morning and you're just sort of like curled up in a fetal position, anxious about ability to do work and then spend half an hour or an hour just like coaxing yourself out to like go face like the day that you don't that you don't want to face. You're like not as good of a romantic partner and like less attentive to the people around you. You don't um, even like have enough like time to get there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it took sort of a toll on our relationship. And then very unexpectedly from my perspective, my ex broke up with me. It was like a really particularly rough breakup. 
And then I just sort of like really went down like a real hole where I like knew it basically immediately was like, oh, fuck, asked my roommate to like, I had like a bunch of like Tylenol PM just because like I have trouble sleeping. I was like, we need to throw that out. I don't want like access to anything that I could use to like hurt myself. I could you, just, knew, like, you knew that immediately. Yeah, immediately. I was like, I am like, this is like the like sort of thing where I was like, it's funny. I haven't had that bad of a depressed episode, despite like, I'm sure I'm one of those people. It's like, oh, fuck, this is the thing. Yeah. So basically had one of the worst weeks of my life. And then sort of transitioned from being about a really hard sort of heartbreaking breakup, which was the sort of catalyst and just was really awful. And I was like really hung up for like a long time. And this was somebody who had been dating for two years. And like we had talked seriously about getting married. It was like a real like, oh, fuck my life. The life that I expected to have, I'm like not having. But the other thing going on was that I had a paper that I was supposed to write at the very end of the year. And so we broke up maybe like a week or two before the paper was due. I was like not doing any paper writing over the next two weeks. And then did this like horrible thing of spending the entire summer, maybe like four or five days a week after my internship, I would go home and it was like, this is gonna be the day that I start working on this paper. And like, look at this blank computer screen and like every day, the guilt and anxiety from like not having made any progress up until then made it increasingly impossible to do, like to get started at all. And it got into this like, I don't know, UG field is often the term that people use for like these things where like you're sort of so upset that they're not already done that all of a sudden they get way, way, way harder to do than they would be under normal circumstances which then means it's going to be even later. And there's like a real potential for a spiral there. So I sort of, that actually ended up becoming a much more serious problem. And I think it had like lasting impacts on my relationship to writing. And I'm like, partly for this reason, part, partly for other reasons, like much more anxious about writing than I ever had been. Anyways, spent the summer very miserable and then sort of went back to law school, sought actual mental health care for the first time around then. It was in like a really bad state. Like, uh, I was just, like, not particularly safe. And doing things like avoiding the law school, except for when I had to be in class, because, like, what would I say if I ran into the professor who, like, I owed this paper to? Avoiding my friends, because it was, like, embarrassing that I had done this. Yeah, so it was, like, it was, it was, like, pretty rough. So what did it look like to actually seek out help? Were you doing, like, research to try and find psychologists, psychiatrists, or were you just going on campus? Yeah, so at the time, I was on the sort of campus health plan. And so you basically didn't have options. So I actually came back. My like internship ended in like early August. So instead of going back to my parents' house, I went straight to back to Yale with like a month before school started. So I was like, I need to start seeing a therapist ASAP. This is like no good. And so I called them basically said that I came back because I felt like desperately in need of help, told them that I was not suicidal, but was thinking about suicide all of the time. Can I set up an intake appointment? And they're like, we'll get back to you. And then like a month later, I get a phone call. So I, um, this is, I think, like a notorious problem at some US universities, including some that have a ton of resources where like the wait times are just real long. So got an intake appointment, then waited like another couple of weeks then like finally saw a psychiatrist. Yeah, so that was, I guess, uh, the start to actually getting healthcare, and so there's this whole process of like finding a therapist that like basically didn't go go through because you just sort of like use whoever the university assigns you to. Yep. Did you have a positive first experience? I had a very negative first experience. <laughs> yeah. So I started seeing somebody. He was a psychiatrist, but some so psychiatrists are the folks who like are actual MDs. They're doctors. Most of them spend most of their time prescribing medicine. Some of them will do therapy also. I was getting both therapy from this guy and also being prescribed medication. And so he prescribed me clonopin, which is a benzo. It's an anti-anxiety medication. It's basically like a sort of fast acting, acute anxiety type of thing where it's like, it's often used for panic attacks. So it's like, you are feeling just like incredibly anxious in the moment. You take on, hopefully, if it's working well, 15 minutes later, 30 minutes later, you sort of like the volume is just like turned down a whole bunch, you feel like more relaxed, depending on the dose, etc. They can be habit forming, you feel good, like you're like getting a little bit high. 
And so there are a lot of reasons why you might not want to take them daily for extended periods of time. But sort of as just like a stopgap, having like anything that could like allow me to sleep and allow me to have like hours ever where I wasn't just rolling around in like some terrible ball of self-hate and alcohol was like really useful for a few weeks. I also started taking an SSRI at the time, Lexapro, which is sort of like the standard typical like first line antidepressant that people start on. For most people, they take weeks before they start working. It's sort of like much more subtle, hard to tell if it's working. So yeah, so I had sort of like the benzos to just get me through like, I can't sleep tonight or like, I need anything to do to turn this down for a few hours. And then like the SSRIs at the time were like, hopefully the more, like the longer term treatment option. And so, I mean, how long was it until things started to get better after that? Yeah, so I guess that was like September. And I think it was maybe December or January, where I sort of like started feeling like my normal self again was like, able to go and socialize, able to like enter the law school without just waves of guilt and self-hate. Yeah, just like basically able to function again. And it was like a pretty quick switch over the course of two or three weeks from, it was like gradually getting better, but it definitely felt like there was like a moment where it was like, sort of getting, start getting like success files or something. It's like, oh, I'm like able to hang out with friends again. That gives me the confidence to like talk to that professor I wanted to be a research assistant for and like get a job working for him oh, he's like really happy with the idea of me working for him. And sort of like very quickly, over the course of a few weeks, got my life sort of like back together. Cool. And I guess that was just everything sorted. The rest of your life Um, was fine. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And so here I am today, mentally healthy at 80,000 hours, (laughs) um, telling you that you too could um, have all of your mental health problems solved with the first pill that you try the first time that you try it. Okay, That's... so so, so um, where do we head to next? Yeah, so I guess my experience from there is I apparently got better a bit too quickly for my psychiatrist at the time, who became worried that I was having what's called a hypomanic episode, which is basically like a mini manic episode. So there's sort of like two, it's probably really actually a spectrum more complicated, but like psychiatry now labels bipolar as sort of like two types of bipolar. There's bipolar one, which is like the sort of like stereotype of bipolar, where people have full-blown manic episodes. Sometimes those include like psychotic symptoms, often include lots of like risk-taking, lots of sort of behavior that's just like very unusual for that person. Just like a real, real noticeable shift that I think in retrospect, very few, although not none, people are like glad that they had manic episode. A lot of people like spend tons of money and up doing things that like upset their like friends and family. Um, So bipolar one, Involves, like, those are full-blown manic episodes, and then usually also some sort of depressive episode. Bipolar 2 is sort of like a condition where you have depressed episodes are, like, a much bigger part of what's going on. Then you sometimes have these hypomanic episodes, which are, like, mini-manic episodes. And something can be a hypomanic episode, even if it has no negative consequences. And so for me, I believe at the time, I still believe it, uh, there were, like, no negative consequences. Like to the extent that anything was going on, it was like, oh, I'm like confident now and able to like talk to strangers and like able to start projects. This seems pretty good. Does it look a bit like a period that I talked about in college where I was like going overboard? I guess you could draw a pattern there. Like I'm willing to like listen to my psychiatrist. But, like if this is all that's going on. This doesn't seem like a problem to me. Right. It seems sort of indistinguishable from just getting better. Yep. Or like getting better and then being like better than normal, which like, great. The problem is that it is sometimes the case that hypomanic episodes sort of like progress towards eventually becoming manic episodes. And I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not an expert in mental illness. I did do some research because I was personally affected. I think it was not that much known about if you have had hypomanic episodes ever, or like if you have more hypomanic episodes, what effect does that have on your likelihood of having a manic episode? So my psychiatrist thought I was having a hypomanic episode and basically told me I had to decide between going on a mood stabilizer, which is a drug that's it's an antipsychotic. It's often used to treat some forms of bipolar disorder. It's also used sometimes to treat schizophrenia that like a lot of people have very good experiences with. Also has some like, uh, well, there are many different mood stabilizers. Most of them have some like somewhat severe side effects. So basically told me I could either add one of those 
or he was going to stop prescribing my antidepressants. The theory there is that there are some theories that maybe SSRIs make it more likely that somebody with bipolar 2, who's never had a manic episode before, has their first manic episode. I asked my psychiatrist, can you like, give me some information about like the evidence for this? And like, how big of a risk are we talking about? If these like periods of time are actually really good, I want to know like what trade-off is going on. Um, he's our first told me he was going to like send me some research and then I like, come back to do, 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 do. And he told me that he actually makes decisions based on rules of thumb and not based on research. And I like showed him all these research papers saying that like, actually it doesn't look like SSRI is making more likely to have a manic episode. And he was just uninterested. And so, yeah, from there, I uh, fairly rapidly went through going off of SSRIs, which for me was like a somewhat miserable experience with some like withdrawal symptoms and found that experience of the mental health care system really like disempowering and frustrating. And I have since come to believe pretty confidently that I do not have bipolar disorder, um, like any form of bipolar disorder. And I was just getting better. And that makes it sort of more frustrating that I was put in that position and not allowed to like make that trade-off for myself. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a really good example of how important it is to find the right therapist or psychiatrist. Yeah, I think that's right. And I don't know, like I, I'm a big believer in the value of like trying to get mental health care, which we will talk about later. And so I like tell a story and I like worry that I'm going to scare people off from like ever seeing someone. And so I don't know, I just want to make it clear, like this is not a typical experience. There are also, I think, especially at universities, there's like a specific thing where I think that they are less likely to give patients agency over the decisions that they're making. They feel sort of more responsible for sort of paternalistically like protecting them. I think that there's like a conservatism thing and like um, risk aversion and like litigation management thing where like if you like don't give an antidepressant to like a depressed person, maybe they go home. It just like doesn't seem like you like really fucked up. Whereas like because there's like a lot more stigma around manic episodes, it's just like unacceptable to ever make the trade off where it's like I'm going to like increase the risk slightly that someone will have a manic episode in order to like help them treat their depression, which sucks because it's just like not necessarily the trade-off that patients would make. And this isn't like a medical question exactly. Like the question of how big the trade-off is, is something like a doctor might be an expert in. The question of like, what trade-off do you want to make in your life? In my mind is like not a thing that there's like this special expertise someone might have on. So yeah, I think it can feel very frustrating when doctors sort of like takes that choice out of your hands. If the options were open to college kids, would you recommend that they try and look outside of campus to try and find help? That's a good question. I think the quality of mental health care on university campuses in the US, which is basically all I know about. I really don't know anything about mental health care on campuses in other countries. I think that the quality just varies a ton across campuses. And even places where it's good, you will sometimes hear like horror stories. Like every once in a while, they just get worried that a student might commit suicide, which is absolutely tragic. And then just like kick the student out because they don't want it to happen, you know, like on their turf. And they tell a story about how the student needs some like time to like rest and relax and recuperate, which sometimes I think is absolutely true. And that's the right decision for some people. And for some people, it's like being ripped out of your social network. And the thing of like giving you purpose is not helpful. So it's just a thing that happens sometimes. Even in places where it's very unusual, it will happen ever. And then that can just be like a really salient news story. Somebody writes something in the college paper and it sounds like a total horror show. I think it's like actually pretty hard. How are we here? I just want to point out that some schools have policies against removing people from campus because they might hurt themselves. So if you're worried about this at a particular school, there's a good chance you can find out what their policy is. Okay, back to the episode. The thing I really recommend is if you're in a position where you can comfortably talk to your friends and see who among them have like used the university mental health care system, talking to them and seeing what kind of an experience they had, I think is the way to go. And then if the answer is like, I had a great experience, absolutely use that. If the answer is, you know, it was like, okay, I didn't love my therapist, but I like learned some techniques or like I got put in the medication I wanted or whatever. If you have the financial resources and other resources to like do some shopping and actually sort of like get to choose somebody who seems like a good fit for you outside the healthcare system, I think it can be like a really good decision for some people. It's really expensive because like the insurance that you're on usually as a student is like specifically covering stuff at the university. Although also check that too, because some universities will have like some amount of coverage. So like 
everything I say, the, the details just like matter a lot. And I have like one person's experience. And so just hope people don't generalize from it too much. Yeah. So I guess that's my take on that. Okay. So where do we, where do we head next? So we're at, we're still at Yale Law. Yeah. So got a bunch better. I went through withdrawal from SSRIs, which sucked. It was not horrible. Didn't like put me like out of commission. The main thing that I experienced was something called brain zaps, which, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, it sounds made up. (laughs) It felt made up. Like I like questioned my sanity. The first time I like told my psychiatrist, like, Hey, yeah, like you booted me off these drugs. So here's what's happening. So it literally feels like static electricity, just buzzing around in your brain. You just like have a few seconds of that. And he's like, told my psychiatrist about that. He's like, oh yeah, those are brain zaps. That, that just happens. I was like, well, nobody warned me about the brain zaps. Um, and then um, I was like, so is there like a technical term for this? And he was like, nope, just brain zaps. I was like, do we know why this happens? <laughs> it's like, nope. Um, just brain zaps. Do do about it? It's like, nope. So that was unpleasant, but I was like fundamentally okay. In some ways I found it reassuring in the sense that it did give me very concrete evidence that antidepressants do something at all. It's like very hard to tell if you just got better from depression because it has been months and months or if like the drug was helping. And so no, that shit's like totally rational, but like going off of it and then like seeing like, oh shit, I have never had a subjective experience like this before. But very clearly like something was happening. So I was, I was very lucky. And while that experience is like unpleasant, I did not sort of like relapse into depression from going off the antidepressants and finished out the year of law school in a relatively stable place. So what what does your life look like while you're in a stable place? Like what's the day-to-day experience like? Is it still like is it like very noticeable that you're having a different experience to people who aren't having any issues with mental health? So it's changed over time and it's gotten worse over time for reasons that we can like talk about later. Um well partly for those reasons, maybe partly for reasons I don't understand. But basically, I think I'm like on a day-to-day basis dealing with mental illness just about every day of my life even when I'm not having like a acute episode of anything in particular. And so for me, what this means is like, part of it is like, just like having sort of a lower mood set point than most people, you know, experience like a wide range of emotions, but my sort of like baseline, I think is just lower than like a more mentally healthy person's would be. I think that's one bit of it. I struggle with sort of like inappropriate amounts of, or I guess like at least maladaptive amounts of like guilt pretty frequently. I have like a very bad case of imposter syndrome. So when at the end of the year, every time we do our performance evaluations, we do sort of like a self-evaluation and then like uh, your boss and like people who work with you evaluate your performance and the difference between the way that I see my work and the way that people around me apparently see my work is just like laughable. So I go around like day by day, just like thinking I'm doing a very bad job, which, you know, sucks. And then I struggle with anxiety a lot. So I think I probably lose hours of work time to anxiety in sort of like an average normal week when I'm doing what's like doing well for me. Okay, so soon after this, I guess you left Yale Law, is that right? Yep, that's right. I sort of lucked into a really amazing opportunity to go work at what was then called GiveWell slash GiveWell Labs and became a spinoff of the Open Philanthropy Project. So ended up getting like a summer internship there that turned into like, a, I know you're in law school, but do you want to come and like help to start this, potentially help to start this like $10 billion foundation instead to yeah, a job that I spent um, several years at helping to get that organization spun up and yeah, moved out to the Bay Area to do that from, uh, from Connecticut. And so while you're in those first few years at Open Phil, are things basically the same that they were at Yale Law or are they, have, they, have they changed? Are you, are you seeing any, any therapists, psychiatrists? Yeah. So I guess as far as like what my new normal was, it was like similar to like the non-depressed parts of law school, but a little bit worse. And so still felt anxious very frequently in a way that like interfered with my work. Still felt depressed or at least like low mood, even though I wasn't having an episode. But it was like, basically okay and functional for those years. So like to give an example of what that means for me, so I have like weekly check-ins with my boss. Um, at some points in time, it was Holden who runs Open Phil. At some points it was Ellie who like runs GiveWell. And so like the hour before those check-ins, I would like basically not be able to work for that hour. 
because of like the level of anxiety that I felt. And it was like, so it was like guilt and anxiety because every time I had to reflect on like, how did the last week go? The answer was always, you didn't do enough. You didn't meet your expectations of yourself. Now you have to like, tell this person that it wasn't really about telling them though. It was more about like, now I have to confront the fact that like you failed again. And so, yeah, so like every, every week before that meeting, like lose an hour of like being productive to just really unuseful negative self-talk. So for people who have never had that kind of experience before, is there a way to give a sense of like what that actually feels like that hour? Yeah. So varies for different people. Anxiety, I think generally has both physical symptoms and like cognitive and psychological symptoms. Some people only have one or the other. Some people have both. But yeah, for me, the physical symptoms, it basically feels like being chased by a bear or like chased by a lion or like something like that. So it's like having your like fight or flight response that is supposed to be adapted to like evolving out in the savanna and having like a predator going after you. Except the thing that you're actually worried about is can I like in the last hour before this meeting get three more projects done so I can like feel good about my week, which is like unreasonable in the first place. But like, so you're like sitting at a computer trying to reason through some difficult research papers, but being like, there's just like a lion chasing you the entire time is like basically my experience with it. And there's like a cognitive cycle associated with it too. So for me, it's just like a lot of repetitive thoughts of like, you fucked up again, you're not gonna be able to do this. You fucked up again, you're not gonna be able to do this. Like that flavor of thing or like, okay, you said that you would get this done, this much done in the next hour before the meeting. It's now been two minutes. You weren't productive in those two minutes. Oh God, does that mean you're not gonna be productive for this entire time? And like the line just gets faster. And then it's like, oh, well now the line's faster. So I'm like even less able to write it. And so now it's been 10 minutes and I haven't started. And then like the line like really fucking speeds up. So there's sort of like a real feedback loop between like the cognitive stuff and like the thoughts and then the physical symptoms for me. Had you been playing around with cognitive behavioral therapy at this point? Were you like trying actively like trying to catch these negative thoughts as they arise? Yeah. So I guess maybe like, I don't remember exactly what it was, but like three months to like a year after I started working at Give Well, Give Well Labs out in the Bay Area. I started seeing a psychiatrist there. This was a much more positive experience than that first one was. So he first, after like, you know, taking like a whole bunch of sessions, to like get to know me, get to know my story, like try and figure out how I think about stuff. He like quickly prescribed me the SSRIs again, which I'm still not sure if they did anything for me, but was like a thing that seemed worth trying to me. And it was, I was very happy that he was just immediately like, yes, if you want to try this, you should be able to try this. So just like got back on all of my medications and then also did therapy with him. So did CBT, which, yeah, as you said, is like a set of techniques that is supposed to try to help you catch these types of like negative self-talk and like notice that you are having these thoughts. Ask yourself, are they actually connected to reality? Think through the like types of biases that anxious and depressed people might have. See like, is this just one of those things? And then hopefully that sort of cuts off the cycle. So I was doing CBT there. CBT typically is like very structured, involves weekly homework and sort of like a set sequence and pattern. Therapists mean very different things. There's like a very range of what they mean when they say they're doing CBT. So like I was not doing a very structured form of sort of like real CBT. I was basically like chatting about whatever was bothering me in a way that was influenced by CBT, something along those lines. I liked that. It seemed nice. He like helped me through some rough moments, but my best guess is that it didn't have like a very noticeable positive effect for me. But I think he like tried a bunch of the right things and it was like a good bet. And like, you know, it might've reduced my anxiety by like 10%. It's just like really hard to know. And the other thing that he did that was just like made my life way, way, way better is I got diagnosed with ADHD while I was seeing him. And so like a year into seeing him, he prescribed me Adderall, um, which is a stimulant that helps with ADHD. And that just made my life much, much better. It made me like a much more productive person. Also, it's the single thing that has helped me the most with my anxiety. So it turns out that like, if you actually might have a shit ton of trouble getting started on whatever assignment you just said that you would do, that just is stressful. Hopefully it's not chased by lion stressful, but it, there just is something to worry about. And so cutting off at least... In large part, one of those main catalysts for like feedback loops for me is actually just like a huge win from that perspective. Have you tried CBT since? 
Have you tried a more structured version of CBT in the years since? Yeah. Out here in London, I spent two or three months doing like a much more structured form of CBT with a therapist I think is fantastic. So it didn't get to the point of helping. We both agreed that it was likely to take a long time, that like a lot of the things that I was like having trouble with were just like some of my like most deeply ingrained thinking habits. They're like really connected to like a lot of my like deepest beliefs. It's just been tons of like reinforcement. The particular type of CBT I did was CBT for perfectionism, which apparently has notoriously long lag times. So like really felt like it was going in the right direction in a way that like no therapy I'd done previously really did. And like it was just like really like aiming at the right things. I just sort of lost the energy for it. I was probably spending too much time being really like a like good sport and like trying like super hard to like be very thorough on the homework when I started. And that was just like very taxing. Shocking for somebody whose problem is setting unrealistic standards for themselves that also in therapy, they would set unrealistic standards for themselves. And then turns out that doing that is self-defeating. And so I just became unable to sort of sustain that level of effort invested into like therapy and basically just like stopped doing a useful job of the homework and then wasn't getting anything out of it. And like spent like a bunch of weeks trying different things to like attempt to get to motivate myself to like pull out that time. I'm like not great at being sure I have tons of free time. Just like was not able to get myself to do it. And I was like, this is not worth my while if I'm not going to like seriously engage with it. Yeah. So quit like a year ago and I think at some point I ought to give it another shot. All right. So to continue our story. So now we're at Open Phil. Yeah. Now we're at Open Phil. And for better or for worse, I had just like a really incredible experience there. Did like this incredibly meaningful work. I was a first program officer for global catastrophic risks. When I started working there, it was there were a bunch of people from GiveWell who were sort of like involved in like helping out to get started up. But there were three of us that were full time. It was uh, me, Holden, and Alexander Berger. And I think it's just like a huge lucky privilege to get to like see a foundation of that size get like built from scratch. And then also to like have a voice in it and to like help to take part in it. It was just like a really incredible experience. And I'm a bit of like a real like true believer on the like long-termism thing. I had never until that point in life felt like there was anything I could like do about it. And so just like didn't work on long-termist stuff, didn't give my money to like long-termist causes and like got there. And I was like, oh, like we're also starting up this global catastrophic risk program area. I was like, wait a second, that like, oh yeah, it does seem bad. Like our biological weapons non-proliferation policy is totally outdated and like not up to current technology. Like, yes, that seems like it could matter for like the long-term future. So um, discovering that there were like things like that that I could contribute to meant a lot to me. Again, for better or for worse, my work became just like a huge part of my identity while I was there. Basically my entire identity. I just like really felt like and feel like I had a mission and like that's what I wanted to do with my life was to like feel like at the end of the day, I like did everything I could to like make sure that the future goes as well as possible. And I just felt like I was like really in an unusually good, lucky experience to like contribute to that. And so, yeah, there were times it was definitely a tough job, felt like a lot of pressure. I sometimes was like a 28 year old kid or whatever with like, I don't remember how old I was, 30, whatever it was, with no actual national security experience meeting with biosecurity and like Department of Defense officials and like telling them like, well, we're really interested in this set of priorities. So I'm sure like that's a shit experience and like the power dynamics really awkward. And so like you know, stressful for me trying to like do a good job. So like there are different parts of it that were stressful. Parts of the culture were like stressful. It's like a really like, explicit communication kind of place. So, you know, sometimes you make mistakes and you're like told that you made a mistake. And, like that's a shitty feeling. But overall, it was just like a felt like just like a really meaningful, like positive part of my life. And I think I like really had the feeling that my life was going much, much better than like 16 year old Howie would have been able to like imagine. But that's also like an additional level of pressure where you now feel like you've got this dream job and you've got to like live up to past Howie. And yeah, that seems incredibly stressful. Yep. Yeah. It felt like very, yeah, just very high stakes. If we went to an area, it was likely we'd be like the biggest funder of that area. And like when I got there, we were sort of all generalists. We hadn't like hired specialists yet because we were still deciding what program areas we're going into. And so I was like, as not an expert in these areas, trying to like get up to speed enough 
that I can help to build up a program area, make initial grants, hire somebody like who's actually an expert to like run it. And yeah, did feel like a lot of pressure at the same time as being very meaningful. Yep. Okay, so I'm in like, what happens next? What happens next is disaster. So was at Open Phil from like 2013 summer, from like mid 2013 to like end of 2016, beginning of 2017. And like had my ups and downs over that period of time. Had months where it's like, it was like clear to the people around me that like Howie struggles with mental illness. Howie's like a very anxious person and it sucks for Howie. And like, had you like spoken to them explicitly about it or was just everyone kind and you? Varying levels. Like basically everybody knew that I was like seeing a psychiatrist. It was important to me and has long been important to me to like, especially when I know it's not going to like negatively affect the brand of organizations I care about to be as open as possible about my experience with mental illness. I think it was just like a lot of stigma. And I happen to be like, fortunately, often in a position where I feel like I'm able to share without it being that costly to me. And so was able to like get other people in the EA community to like start using mental health care because I was like sort of able to be like, oh, there's somebody who's like very public about the fact that they go and use this stuff. So it was like known. I was very close friends with my coworkers. And so they probably had like new different bits of it. I don't think most people knew how severe it had gotten in the past exactly, but they all knew that Howie has some real bad days. Howie's like a little bit fragile. I felt very mixed about how much I should disclose, in part because at that point, there was never a time where I was like in a job. Like there was a period of time I was having trouble with schoolwork. There had never been a a time where I was in a job where it was like anyone thought I was like underperforming because of this. Then I was very worried that if I made it super salient that Howie hears negative feedback and then he gets about 20 times as sad as like you would want him to, I'm just gonna stop getting negative feedback. I'm both gonna impose like a cost on like the people around me who now have to like watch what they say around me. And they're just not gonna tell me. And like, that's not what I want. And so it feels like important to me to have like some ability to say like, yes, it's gonna like be more unpleasant to me than it would be for like a lot of people. This is still something that I like need. I think it's a hard ask to make of people. And so I think it was like a balance between wanting to be open and honest and also not making it salient to everyone around you all the time. Yep, that makes sense. Okay, so getting on to the disaster. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> disaster time. Yeah, so had, so it was like December 2016, I guess I'd been there for like three and a half years, something like that at that point, and had a month or two that was like a down, slightly depressive month or two at the level of like, probably like I have this like a couple times a year. So it was like nothing particularly out of the ordinary. Had some things at work that were stressing me out. It was like less productive because of that, but not in a way that was like super notable, noticeable. Like I don't think that my coworkers would have like noticed or like said anything. It's just like feeling a bit down. And then I said this a bit embarrassing because the actual stimulus for this like huge terrible spiral is something that like in retrospect feels very small. But I was supposed to go to the UK to represent Open Phil at a meeting of a bunch of funders who are considering funding work on gene drives. And it's going to spend like three days at that meeting. So I procrastinated buying the ticket for a while. And then when I bought the ticket, the best bet by far was at this budget airline. So I got the budget airline ticket, which like I would have been really tempted to do anyway. I was always trying to like cut costs because I was like spending open fills money, which like I just like valued as much as my own. So anyways, get my budget airline ticket show up to my flight and the airline doesn't let me on. And so I guess the thing that happened was, so I had a return flight for like three or four days later or whatever. I had no intention to go for more than three or four days, but my passport was set to expire two months later. And this airline uh, apparently had a policy that they don't let you onto a flight if your passport is going to expire in two months which was not my understanding of what expiration date means. But apparently it's like some of the people I talked to had like, I don't know, maybe you have, had heard that this was like a thing before. I've never heard this thing, I think. (laughs) It took me entirely off guard. And like, when at first when they told me, I was like, fuck, like I don't travel a lot. I traveled for work a bunch at Open Phil, but up until I moved to London, I had just like very little experience outside the United States. And I was like, well, shit, maybe everybody knows that your passport just stops working 
like a couple months before um, it expires. It's just like a known thing. So eventually I looked that up and it turns out that like neither Britain nor the U.S. has this rule. You can like look at the websites about visiting the other country and like they explicitly say, as long as your passport will still be good until you leave, you're fine. I tried to get my a refund from the airline and the airline refused to give me a refund and gave me like various stories about where the rule was written down. And each time it just wasn't there. So like it was on your ticket. I was like, look at like here's my ticket. It's not on the ticket. They're like, oh, it's on our frequently asked questions. I like, go to the frequently asked question, not next frequently asked. So um, I think in fact, it was like the extent of responsibility they had for this realistically was like very little. Um, Zero, I would think. Like, I maybe should have like not gone with the budget airline. It was like maybe not the most responsible decision. I, like maybe should have procrastinated less and like maybe it wouldn't have happened. But like it seems like a stretch to assign you any real responsibility. I think it's like basically right. And I think none of my coworkers would have thought at the time that I had made a major fuck up. My reaction to this was just sinking into like a, like a pit of self-hate, just like, like furious rage at myself. And I got like immediately, I just like felt so bad that we were like not going to be at this meeting. We were going to seem like less professional as a foundation, which like already was like a bit of a worry because Open Phil is like much younger than the staff at like a typical foundation. It's like we're, when we're interacting with other foundations, I like really like did not want that to be like the vibe. Yeah, so I just felt like I like really let down. I guess like Open Phil, but like mostly just like the world or like my expectations of myself and took it really hard and like knew basically immediately. I was like, fuck, like I am at risk this might be a very bad problem. And unfortunately, just didn't do anything about it. So I reacted by basically like hiding in bed and camping out and just like sitting around and like drinking and hitting myself. And so I stopped checking email. I stopped checking any of my messages. I mean, like basically impossible to get in touch with me other than the person I was dating at the time. It's like the only person who's able to get in touch with me. And yeah, I think what like, I don't know, a week and a half, two weeks, where like, didn't tell anybody at Open Phil or give well what happened. Didn't tell them that I was like, not going to be at work. Just like lay in bed. And basically I spent like 16 hours a day looking at my browser, thinking about how, number one, I should open my inbox and email them and tell them that what had happened. And like, just like, all right, I'm dropping a lot of balls, set it up so that at least people can like pick up the balls that I'm dropping. Number two, the thing I wanted to do before that was obviously first, I should do all of the work to make up for the fact that I had committed this, this sin. So on day one, there like wasn't that much because like I was supposed to be at this meeting. I wasn't there. There wasn't anything else for me to do. But I just like couldn't get myself to write the email. On day two, it's like I should have been doing stuff on day one. So what if I do everything I'm supposed to do on day one and everything I'm supposed to do today? And like, as soon as I finish doing twice as much work in like one day as is reasonable while in like the worst state of my life, then I can email them and tell them what's going on. And they'll like, I'll be fine because like by the time I like email them, everything will have been fixed. At the point that like, that's what I expected of myself. I knew I would not succeed. So that made me feel really anxious. So I was unable to even get a start. So I was unable to even open my inbox. And then so I've like spiraled out from there. And every day it's like more embarrassing. And just like, it went from like, an understandable thing that happens to people who have depression and mental illness. If I missed one day of work without saying anything and then sent an email being like, I'm so sorry that happened. This thing that was kind of like out of my control happened and it just like really shook me. I like need some time off while I like recover from this. I know it's inconvenient. I know that like I'm working on some things that will be like hard to like cover for, but like I need somebody to cover for me. I think it would have been like, the reaction would have been like, you did a good job handling your mental health crisis. Thank you. This is fine. This happens. Everybody has sick days. And so I was like terrified of like sending this email and like admitting my like enormous failure. Whereas like, I think basically like the people around me would not have thought it was an enormous failure. Once it's been a week, my thoughts were still like disproportionate. I was like feeling pretty suicidal. I like do not think that suicide would have been a reasonable response to this. So it's certainly not having reasonable thoughts, but like it actually at that point was the case. That I had like seriously fucked up. It's like not showing up to work for a week while not telling anyone what's going on. I'm like in touch with many of the people there now, like both professionally and as friends. Still have not had like the real conversation about exactly how much of a mess did I cause. 
I'm sure there were like tons of people who have like incredibly important jobs that like I care a ton about them doing their jobs who had to like put a ton of their like time and effort and energy into like cleaning up the mess that I was leaving. Like it was like a real thing. It's like a real mistake I made at that point. And I was like a quite bad professional mistake. And that obviously I reacted to even more strongly. And then after like two weeks, that's like, you know, just a lot worse. And after two weeks, I somehow, I don't know how I did it, brought myself, I dragged myself over and just showed up to work. Oh, you just showed up. Yeah. I was like, I am so sorry. And Ellie was like an angel, just like could not have been sweeter about it. Like, it's like asked, what can I do? Like, we want to like get you back as soon as we can. But obviously, like you need to like take care of yourself. Just like could not have handled it any better. Or at least I would not know how to tell him to handle it any better. And then I just was in bed again for like, a month and a half for a month or whatever, did not check email, did not check messenger, just like shut myself off from like any like stimulus because like any exposure to the world could like lead me to reminders of like how bad it was. Was the month and a half after that first two weeks, was it a different experience? Because now at least people knew you, you know, you were home. Did they not know what was happening? I think that they basically knew. Right. Some combination of actually somebody who like, I didn't work with that much who, uh, yeah, like one of the people I knew less while there was like, well, like years later, he was like, yeah, what the hell happened? I was like, explain to him. He's like, yep, that's basically what I assumed. I think like people knew. And also my people like got in touch with my girlfriend at the time. I was still like sometimes managing to like drag myself from my bed to like her bed. And I could just like lie and follow there. So people like knew what was going on, but certainly would like did not have me as someone who could be like an active participant in like helping to like get things sorted that I was like dropping. Hey, it's Howie. I just wanted to mention that my friends and coworkers did a whole lot of checking in on me that didn't really come through in the episode and that I'm really grateful for. All right, back to the conversation. And yeah, I mean, I still feel very guilty about this and guilty about like what I must have like put these people through and just like bad that like, I'm sure that like important work and like the area of like biosecurity like did get dropped. And you know, it just is something that like, it would have taken an email, like when I found out that I like, I was going to miss my flight, that was like, I am not doing okay. I don't even have the energy to like, tell you what to do about it. But FYI, like plan for it, I might be out for a while. And I think everybody there would have been so understanding. And like would have been fine. Yeah, it's like, probably like the biggest regret of my life. that I just didn't do that. So you're in bed for another month and a half. So where does our story take us next? Yeah. So then a friend of mine who I always think of as like a hero for doing this, who was a coworker at GiveWell, Josh Rosenberg, emailed one of my friends from law school in DC, who he did not know at all, but he knew that my friend Sparky had been really helpful during my like law school depressed episode and was like sparky like how is a fucking disaster can you do something about this and sparky convinced me to go to dc and just like stay with him for a month and it was so good to be taken like out of like one thing that's hard about this is like ea is like now also my like social community as well as my professional community and so it's like there's no way for me to like be in my community without just being reminded about this all the time like especially then I was like, okay, great. So now I'm like terrified of seeing almost all of my best friends because they're also my coworkers. So like getting out of that situation for a while was like really good. So I emailed Ellie at GiveWell, my boss at the time. and was like, I'm so sorry again. This is terrible. Obviously it looks like I like quit my job. I didn't mean to do it this way. This sucks. Yeah, just like apologized a lot. And then we like got coffee. He was again, just like really kind about it. Didn't, like, sugarcoat the fact that, yeah, people, like, had to, like, clean up some of my shit. But, like, definitely, like, trying to rub it. Just, like, handle it as well as, like, a person possibly could. And so I, like, officially quit my job. I don't know if... Quit my job, got fired from my job. It's, like, pretty unclear at that point. But some some mix of the two. And went and spent, like, a month on the East Coast. So, like, away from all of that. And, like, a sort of, like, hopeful attempt to get better. That seems like something that might be like very useful for people here. <laughs> that just seems like such a good idea. Yeah, that was like getting into a different environment was really good for me. Sadly, I don't think that I can ask Sparky to take on care for <laughs> all the listeners of the podcast. I'm just like <laughs> incredibly lucky to have him in my life. And yeah, I think um, 
I feel like it was really helpful to me when I was like very worried about myself in law school and then like also did this. So I just like will never be able to repay that. Yeah. So I do think that like this is actually kind of a reproducible thing or like this like a thing that if you have like the privilege of like the savings that you can just like pick up and go and like people that you can go to who you like feel comfortable with to like change your environment and put yourself in a place where you have like no expectations of yourself. If you're in one of these like loops of like constantly trying it's a whole period of like a month and a half i was just like sitting there telling myself what if i was productive today maybe i can like make up for all of the like potential that i had like lost over the last whatever and some like attempts to like translate the peter singer thing into like long-term is like oh and maybe i can make up for it, all of it today it was like every day i sat there like hitting myself at the computer not able to like even try so doing the thing of like i am leaving this space i am like not gonna have any expectations of myself and just like put myself in Sparky's hands. I think it was like a very good decision. Howie here. I just want to flag that people should definitely not take the way I handled all this as a model of what to do. In particular, I didn't seek nearly as much treatment as I should have at this point in my life. And it's possible somebody in my position should have been considering some kind of structured outpatient treatment or an inpatient program. So it was probably a mistake that I didn't consider those things and just wanted to make sure I didn't set a bad example. Okay, back to the episode. I feel like there's a really good piece of practical advice there, which is that that's a really good reason for making sure that you have sufficient savings to be able to just do that. Beyond just people would normally think, oh, yeah, I've got to have like emergency savings for, I don't know, they get cancer or something. But like this just seems like a really good reason to be able to just do nothing for a few months and yeah. not actually be stressed about like, oh, am I actually going to be on the streets? Yeah, I think for people my age and of like, I don't know, my socioeconomic status and like people who are similar to me in like a bunch of ways. Actually, if you like need a ton of runway, mental illness like just is one of the like more likely reasons that, that might happen. And yeah, I think having like money saved for that kind of situation is really useful. And I'm a person who has like had a complicated relationship with money since I was like pretty young. And in particular, spending money on myself and like keeping it for myself and like saving it for myself when like I know that it could be going to like efforts to make the world a better place. And was like, at various points, like, I know tons of people are more extreme than me, somewhat on the extreme side on this front. Luckily, was like pretty frugal and like knew that this was like kind of a possibility. And so ended up with a bit over a year of runway saved up. And there had been always part of me that was like, I should just give away this like pot of savings. Like, why am I entitled to have this? And I'm so glad that I didn't do that. I like became very close to like, I like ran out of runway at the very end of this like period and left out of work for basically a year and a half and didn't know how I was like planning to like make rent or whatever. I think the answer probably would have been friends would have helped me out. People would have like found donations to like, at that point I was like able to like be somewhat productive again. So like to like give me some sort of runway to like start doing research and like figure out what I was going to do with myself. But I think I would have felt very bad about putting that burden on my friends and that like wouldn't have been mentally healthy for me and also just like i'm super lucky that i have like some access to that kind of thing and like a lot of people don't so i think it was like really good that good for like not just for me i mean it's good for me but also good for like the effect autism community good for like the causes i care about that i was able to like take care of myself and also i didn't have to rush into some job where i like wouldn't be doing any good because i was about to be broke so i think that, that was like the right decision in retrospect from, uh, I don't know, like a utilitarian perspective, even though it's certainly saving that money felt bad to me at the time and felt selfish yeah. to me at the time. That definitely seems right. I mean, I think that's also like a really good point in favor of becoming part of something like the effective altruism community. I don't know, there's just like a level of safety that you wouldn't have if you were just on your own. Yeah, I think that there is something to be said for that. And the effective altruism community has just been so, so incredible to me over all of this. And it's like so supportive in like more ways than I can name and like uh well we'll talk later about like some of the specific ways in which this is the case but yeah like i'm just like touched and grateful and just i'm very lucky that i had this and i think the EA community does a bunch of like taking care of people when they're down and even things like giving someone your couch can just like make a huge deal i mean getting sparky's spare bed made a huge difference in my life but like i think i also was lucky to have some types of support that a typical person just wouldn't have and it's like not the type of thing that a community can provide to like Everybody went gets dozens of people large. Yeah, I mean, it's good to be acknowledging that in many ways you were like very lucky, countering the fact that you like got unlucky in this other specific way. 
So what did it look like the road from that point towards starting to work again? Yeah, I guess what happened. Spent some time on the East Coast, went back to Oakland, had a minor redebacle. So going to the East Coast helped a lot. And I got to the point where I was like, still like very bad. Just like did not know how to forgive myself over like messing up at a job that just like felt like my life's work was helping that organization grow. But I was like functional. I think I may have been, this stretch of time may have been the first time I was a guest the 80,000 hours podcast um, and talk about biosecurity. But this is like two to three week period where I was doing much better. And one of the things I did was recorded that with Rob. Who I didn't know well at the time. And then proceeded to like not respond to any of his emails about like checking the transcript because he got me like the one window of time where I was okay. I just ended up placing the episode. But yeah, so got back. I was like starting to become functional. Opened my inbox. Another way in which I'm just like so lucky and grateful. I had like basically like not quite job offers, but people who like quite badly wanted me to work with them. It was like waiting for me in my inbox that I hadn't opened for like months and months and months because I was terrified about it. And so actually like started on the process of like doing a bit of remote work. Basically one of the emails that I got was from FHI. It was when Toby was just starting writing his book, The Precipice. Um, this is Toby Ord, a philosopher at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford, who wrote a really fantastic book that's sort of like canonical introduction to existential risk. And so started doing some remote work, being a research assistant on that book. And like, actually I was like starting to get back up on my feet. That did feel like I hit like the combination of like, this is the type of work I've done before and like a less stressful, less responsibility type of it. So it actually did seem like a good way to like start getting some like success spirals. And it was on like, Something that was inc- incredibly meaningful to me, like felt important. I think it's important that like his book does well. I think the book turned out fantastic. So got a visa, was like ready to go. And then ran into a bit of a roadblock. And I guess one thing that I think is a common experience for people with mental illness is like stuff is just up and down and like getting better and recovering often doesn't look like a straight line. And that doesn't mean that's not getting better or that's not going to get better. And so it was like heartbreaking to like get worse again. I stopped doing work for the precipice, and then just spend another like nine months in bed. Mainly ruminating on now having having stopped work on the precipice, or is this just like everything combined? It was just a combination. It's like some overall sense of like what sort of person am I or something. What will I ever be able to do in the future? Just like hating myself for like fucking up. It's like fucking up again, but also fucking up in the first place. Wow, just like this whole sweet of it's like worrying about like am I going to be able to contribute to the world again like this is like it's like was my identity and who I was and I think I like did not and honestly don't really anymore like know who I am without that and yeah so I just like really didn't know what to do with myself or even where to start but that all makes it sound like somewhat complicated whereas like the actual like experience of it was just I was either experiencing just like immense rage at myself Going out, like, bits of, like, self-harm, punching trees and, like, that kind of thing. And, like, being sort of, like, really awful in that way. Or just playing video games. And, like, was able to at least ever have, like, a moment where I was, like, in flow and, like, not just self-hatred mode through that. So I hadn't played computer games up until then since halfway through college when I realized that they were, like, addictive. And I had to break all of them in half because I was either (laughs) going to do college or I was going to do video games, but not both. (laughs) That makes sense to me. How does that time in bed end? Like, is there like a catalyst or is it just eventually you just have like one day of strength or how how does that end? So what happened? I began feeling really averse to seeing my roommates, which if they ever listened to this, like, I'm sorry, guys, you're wonderful. I don't know. It was like me, not you. Um, Anyways, (laughs) I just like worked a lot when I was at Openfill. So I didn't have a ton of time to like get to know like a set of people. A really nice relationship. Honestly, like, had some, like, really vulnerable conversations that, like, made me feel close. Like, they were not the people who, like, wanted to, like, talk about the worst depressed episode of my life with. But I also felt very guilty about not giving them the chance to be supportive. So, like, it would just, like, suck to have your roommate down just, like, in your house, in their bedroom, like, this much of a disaster and, like, not helping. And it's, like, felt very bad for putting them in that position, which made me avoidant. Like, like, very, very bad. Like, not leaving my room for days and days at a time. 
And I suppose like this is interacting with stuff about money where it's like my first instinct was like, oh, you should get a place by yourself. But like that presumably says not on the table. Yeah, that was not not on the table. And having to have a conversation with them. Like I didn't tell them I was going to the East Coast. And I felt very bad about that. Sure, they figured out what was happening. They had like enough friends in common that like they sure they talked to someone. But I felt very guilty about I mean it's just ugly feel thing again, to be honest. It's like if you don't see your roommate for a day, that's normal. Sometimes you just don't overlap. If you don't see them for three days, it's like pretty weird. And then it feels like it like requires an explanation. And like then you like don't really want to see them because oh god, how am I gonna explain that the reason was I was just like in bed the entire time? What if I just like don't leave my room today? And it's like four days, then it's been like two weeks and they haven't seen you. And you're like sneaking out to the bathroom. I ended up mustering up the like moxie or whatever to go hang out one night with an ex-girlfriend of mine. I like, heard about this and was like, you're coming to live at my place. Uh, this is like unacceptable. So I spent I mean, like four or five months living at her place. And I, there's so many people who I just like feel like I like owe my life to basically. And yeah, I'm just like so lucky that my co was like not dating anymore. Did this for me. And it was just like, it's like very intrusive to have your ex-boyfriend like living at your house. Being depressed and like really unfun. Yeah, so I'm super grateful for that. So I spent like, you know, months basically like living there. And then I think the thing that actually got me to like emerge again, and this is not necessarily the most mentally healthy way to get myself to do it, was I just got started to feel really guilty about being a burden on her. Now it's been like, like a month was fine, but like several months, like she probably wants to have a dating life. Like she can have a dating life when I'm here. Like this is just too much. And like one day just sort of like through like willpower or something was like, okay, I need to move out. I need to move back to like my apartment. And at that point I've been doing like better by enough that interacting with other people was like at all feasible. So I could sort of like start to take like baby steps. And is this around about the time the 80,000 hours starts coming into your life properly? This is the time that 80,000 hours starts properly coming into my life. So one thing that happens at this time is Rob, who like at this point done that podcast episode with him. So like knew him and like we had like interacted professionally once or twice. We had exchanged a bunch of Facebook messages, not all of them cordial. Um, <laughs> we, um, I did, um, we did have some somewhat testy disagreements, although I think that like they didn't like leave a bad taste in anybody's mouth. And years later, we were able to like get drunk and go back through them and like relitigate them, um, <laughs> which was fun. But yeah, someone who did not know all that well, I can't remember exactly how this happened, but like he asked me to like go to a party with him. I was like, well, I have not spoken to a friend basically in a year other than like people I was staying with. I need to do something to like start a social life again. I have like get really socially anxious. I'm like terrified of like hanging out with new people. But like, I just like got to get myself to do this. So Rob was just like a hero and dragged me out a few times. And like part of it was just like a exposure therapy thing. Having spent that much time not socializing with anyone, just like felt very overwhelming to do it. And so sort of getting myself out into the habit of again was really good. And then Rob knew that I was feeling very awkward about being around my housemates. But there was a spare bedroom in the house up in Berkeley. And so he was like, stay here, be around your friends. Which like at that time was like a stretch. Like I think I I had like once Skyped with Brenton at that point, who was living there. And once ran into Peter. It's not people I like knew well at all. Then I had, like, talked to a bit more. It's like, yeah, just, like, stay here, be around, like, your friends. And, like, a touching thing about this, my experience in this community is, like, because we were in the same community, like, these people were my friends, or turned out to be. And so I spent a bunch of time living at the ADK house while sort of, like, integrating back into the community, starting to think about, like, first just, like, having friends again, setting up my social life. Emailing all of my friends and being like, I'm sorry I didn't talk to you for a year. Some of whom I was able to email and do this, and some of whom I, like, felt too guilty about it. And, like, I lost friendships that way. But, like, setting up my life again, I sort of had, like, a place to do that from, which I was really lucky about. So that was, I guess, the first way that ADK really, like, entered into my life. That's very cool. That makes me very happy to be associated with ADK. Um, it was really touching and meant a lot to me and, like, I don't know, like, always will. And then they started trying to convince you to start doing some work for us? Yeah. So I spent a few months like trying to set up my life and then start seriously thinking about what I should do with my life career wise, which I find to be an incredibly aversive, painful process. 
turns out that like something that, as you will know, if you check out our website or any of our resources on career planning, thinking about your strengths and weaknesses is very useful if you're thinking about what jobs to apply to. And as somebody who, in the best of circumstances, is like very bad at believing that I have strengths and very good at really, really counting on those weaknesses, doing a realistic job of a job search and not just having it turn into like, here are all the reasons I like ruined my life by like losing my last job was just like very difficult and painful. And then there was like a new obstacle there, which was I felt genuinely unsure about how frequently is this going to happen to me in the future? And like, how much should I let mental illness limit the places that I'm willing to work? And places I've worked, I'm lucky enough to work at places where like, I care about the mission deeply. Like my life's goal and meaning is like the same as theirs. And so like, I do not want to be in a position where like, I harm the organization by taking on work that my mental illness just like, means I can't reliably do. And so I was very worried about that. And with something that like, only hits like a certain level every three or four years. I think it's just like very difficult to figure out how to think about that in a career planning process. Because you can be, I don't know, how old was I at the time? Like 32. And it's happened like two and a half times. And like after each time I like change my treatment regimen. So like maybe the new thing's going to work. And like maybe like six years later, you'll have enough data to like know. But like in the meantime, it's like very unclear how much I should be limiting myself. I thought a bunch about, do I want to go work in DC? Do something like AI policy, try and like leverage having like worked at a think tank way back when and like, so like network I still had from law school. I just like, wasn't clear to me if I could count on being able to like have that type of career. And just like thinking that through was like fairly unpleasant. So I was doing that. And also just trying to figure out like what I believe about stuff in a year, just like a lot of things had changed. Like the AI world had changed. What EAs thought about a lot of stuff had changed. So like trying to get caught up, reading a ton about AI policy, just as like a self-study, like figure out what's going on, figure out if this is an area I want to work in type of thing. And so I did sort of like a abbreviated job search. One thing I wanted to talk about was when you started working at ADK properly, like you were super upfront with Ben, Ben Todd, our CEO. Yeah, how did that conversation go? Yeah, two ways to think about this. One of them is like, ADK as an organization is really important to me and it was before I worked here. And so I wanted to make sure I was doing everything that was in ADK's interest. Also, it's not like I had that much of a choice. E is a small community. There aren't that many organizations. It was impossible for people to like not notice like, oh, like one of the people who's been around since 2013 playing like an important role at Open Phil disappeared for a year. Uh, and then he's been like hanging out on the couch. So I don't know. You could have had like an elaborate backstory. Could have been I like a have. rumor that you were like a spy. It could, yeah. There were other options. Which have gone really well until like somebody did a reference check with Holden. Yeah. So it was just like important to me, but I want to sound like I'm like super noble and was like trying to like win one for transparency or something to basically be as open with Ben as I possibly could. And so after ADK had like made me an offer Before I accepted it, I had a conversation with Ben where I just did my best to like lay out everything that I knew about my mental health and say like, look, these, I think, would be good reasons to not hire me. I don't trust my own opinion about this because I will always find good reasons to not hire me. So like, I think you'd be making a mistake. Also, you just like can't put any weight on my opinion about this kind of thing. But I at least want you to know these things are real. There is some chance that I will start working for you. And then like, I would like to think that I've learned my lesson. And if I have another serious depressed episode, I will immediately do the thing of like, what's the minimal thing I can do that will like make sure that like everybody who has to like clean up after me has the smoothest experience possible, or at least has a heads up that's happening. I'd like to think I'll do that. I can't say for sure. I'm like, oh, for one. So, you know, it's like, look, I may, it seems to happen every three to four years. It may be the case that like all of a sudden I disappear. Also like, I lose a lot of times like anxiety. I feel terribly bad still about not being at my last job. I'm like, not sure what that's going to do for team morale. I'm like very worried about that. Having somebody who's still like sort of like hung up over this terrible mistake that made them like leave the last place. It's, it's like being in a relationship and pining after the last person. I think it's like very much like that. It felt and feels like a breakup. And yeah, so just had a very upfront conversation with him where I was like, if you say that having taken all of that on board, you like want me to work here then I will trust your judgment. But I think a really nice thing about the EA community, and like you obviously cannot do this 
for every job. And like a lot of places, like there's just too much stigma around mental illness to like have this kind of conversation. And they're just like not going to take the risk. But it is incredible that there are places where you can do that. And it just like was the case that Ben and I wanted the same thing. We both wanted me to be hired in like the cases where it would be good for ADK to do it. And neither of us wanted me to be hired in the cases where it would be a mistake. And so we're actually like able to be collaborative where I was like, here is everything I know about like the likelihood that things will go wrong. And, you know, he like basically said, look, we're willing to like accept that risk. Also, we will like do things to like at least at first until we like get more information about how stable you're better to like mitigate that risk. So there are plenty of types of work where if all of a sudden you dropped off the face of the earth, like nobody was relying on you so badly in such a time sensitive way that it would be like a huge disaster. We can like make sure that you're doing that at least like to start. And yeah. So we had like a real conversation like that. And yeah. So I guess one lesson from that experience is I think that like some EAs have a perception that the community is this sort of like, because of how a bunch of people like utilitarian values or people who are like so dedicated to like the impartial good or like whatever, that would be like really like cutthroat or ununderstanding or like unsympathetic. And so if like people like hear that you like made a fuck up or that you have a problem or that you have mental illness and be like, well, I am definitely not going to like take a risk on that person. And like, I can't sit here and tell anyone that it isn't harder to get hired if you have some sort of mental illness that makes you worse at your job, which I just definitely do. But I think it just like is a huge credit to the EA community that at least I was like privileged enough that like people were willing to look past that for me and willing to like say, look, how he definitely has some limitations. Are there still things that he could do that make him a really good hire? And my experience is I know of like other people who have like had similar experience, people with chronic illness that like imposes like real limitations on them at various sort of like central EA organizations. Um, an organization been, like very willing to like hire those folks and like make accommodations to like put them in a situation where like they can thrive. And like ADK has certainly done that for me. And I'm like, no, feel very lucky to be in a community where that is sort of the norm. Yeah, that's fantastic. I guess I also do want to caveat that. It's like I am, uh, this is going to be a theme. I am in just like a place of like an enormous amount of privilege. I think like having been around since 2013, at, like a high profile organization, I just got a lot of chances to like, quote unquote, prove myself or at least have a big network, know everybody, have people just like feel like they've benefited from my advice ever. And that helps to make it worth thinking hard about like, well, exactly how much would these limitations limit a person. And so I think it speaks really well to the community that like I had the experience that I had. It's like tragic, but I like, don't feel like I can say like, I know that everybody else will have this experience. Yep. That seems right. Did you have any issues like you were in the US while this was happening, obviously? Um, did you have any issues with health insurance? Yeah. So we talked before about how I'm really glad that I saved up like a year, year and a half of runway. On the other hand, I was definitely cutting corners in order to make that runway into like a year, year and a half, which like I think is some evidence that I probably should have been saving a bit more and giving away a bit less. By my like last year at OpenFill, I was giving away half my income, which is I think understand why past Howie was doing that and like admire it. I think it was probably like too much. In any case, after my health insurance from OpenFill ran out, I was uninsured for basically the whole time until I started at ADK. So I had like a year where the plan was don't get hurt and started to like go off of some of the drugs that like keep me going. So it's like couldn't afford them anymore. Like how how expensive are we saying? So I think it was like Adderall was going to be like a couple hundred bucks a month. And by the end, I was pretty close to like broke, broke. It's possible I would end up with help from some family money if things really got to the place where I was like out in the streets. But that is like, does not feel like an outcome that's like actually like acceptable or like within the, so like, I both want to acknowledge like I'm privileged that like this exists, but like, I think I'd actually feel pretty uncomfortable taking that money. And like, even if the choices became pretty dire. So anyways, yeah, I was like basically out of money and like trying to do what I could to like make it last. I was like at the point of just like not taking medications I need. So I don't know, it like sucks that like people can end up in that position. And there actually is a resource that people should totally know about 
which we can put in the show notes. I unfortunately can't remember the name of it, but there's a website that you can go to if you're in the U.S. that gives you like coupons for prescription drugs. And basically it's like nobody who's not insured can like afford the actual prices. So they only really want to charge that to like the insurance companies. So if you're not insured, you can like get these coupons and then actually get the drugs for like reasonable prices. Unfortunately, they stopped doing that for scheduled drugs. And so because like Adderall is abusable, they stopped accepting those coupons. So it's just like full price. Yeah, so I was like trying to like get myself back on my feet and figure out like, hey, am I still a person who can do research? And like, meanwhile, like skimping on like the medications that let me do that. So it's like a pretty rough spot. And I don't know, lucky for me, it was like a short period of time in my life. And I'm like really privileged and lucky as like an American, like not all Americans have this, unfortunately, to like have had good health care for like my whole life. But I don't know, it like felt pretty shitty and like scary to be in that situation. And so I don't know. At least want to like put some pitch out there for like, you can like hit a place that like really sucks and then get yourself back up on your feet eventually. Yeah. I mean, I I just want to like double down on the runway thing that we were talking about before where like that obviously should come into it. I mean, maybe, maybe just in like in terms of calculating how much you actually need, what you consider to be a year of runway maybe actually needs to change if you consider that you don't have health insurance. Yeah. Do you think it's possible to offer an opinion on when it might actually be correct to quit a job for mental health reasons? I'm imagining that there are like real positives and negatives where like if you just tried to reduce your hours and you're still working somewhat, you would have probably a higher maintained sense of purpose. But then at the same time, if you were working like 10, 15 hours a week or something, you would constantly be getting reminders of there were these specific projects that were due and that maybe you should be like helping out there. So I can imagine that being quite stressful. Yeah, do you have any like feelings on that? So I think that's a really difficult situation and my main answer is it just like depends on the individual circumstances and like i have had thoughts in individual circumstances and have given friends advice on this and like yeah so like i think it's like a real decision that's like a tough decision i think it's hard to say things that are generalizable one way a framework that i like try to use to like think about this is sort of asking okay do you have a need for having a sense of purpose having a sense of like community or like solidarity with your team, having just like a structure of a place to go. Those are things that like the jobs give a lot of people that I think are like important and like helpful for mental health. On the other hand, my experience is that for a lot of people, sort of like negative failure spirals are a big part of what takes a like patch of depression and turns it into like a serious period of like real bad mental illness that just ends up causing you like a lot of suffering. And so avoiding those negative spirals and just like so, so important. I think one part of that is like if you are at reduced capacity because of feeling a bit depressed or feeling a bit anxious, I think it's really tempting to still have the same expectations of yourself as you did when like you didn't feel like you were getting chased by a lion while at the same time attempting to do the work. And so there's a real danger that if you don't like change your expectations of yourself. You're just putting yourself in a position where you will definitely fail. And then like being a person who's like a little depressed and then is like failing at things and like putting yourself in a position where like you are just going to repeatedly do it. You've just like decided to fail at things. That is a very bad position to be in. It's like just a good way to like feel worse about yourself and sort of like spiral in that way. So I think that there is this difficult balance of wanting to keep the things that are like giving you structure and meaning and purpose in your life and then also wanting to like, make sure you're not putting yourself in a like situation that's like I don't know, like self-destructive or just like where you're like setting yourself goals that you just like can't possibly meet. And so that just means different things for different people. And I think there is one meme out there that I really strongly disagree with. That's like, look, you're like mental health is the most important thing in the entire world. Do whatever it takes to get that fixed. If you're feeling bad, take a break, you know, focus on yourself. That's your priority until you get healthy. There are things like close to that that I agree with, but some of us aren't going to have a moment where it's like, all right, you're like healthy now. You are officially a normal and like you get like a certificate. For some people, it's just gonna be like a lifelong struggle. And so I at least 
don't want to put off living my life and doing the parts of my life that will matter to me until this is like fixed. And that's like really important to me because like years where I'm like trying to fix this thing are also like years of my life. I think like, so it is like important to like consider that. And some people are the type of people who can be super functional and be really depressed or really anxious at the same time. And like, I think for some of them, the right choice is to just keep doing what you're doing. Also, one of the most valuable things you can possibly do is to get your mental health treatment better. And we'll talk about that later. And like, I just think it's like so, so valuable to see if there's a way that you can do that. But like, also just like keeping your life the same at the same time is like the right decision for some people. And for some people, it's like, this is putting me at risk of failing in a way that is going to like make me self undermine. And like, I just need a break or just like need the like space, like the headspace to like think things through and actually work on myself instead of like every day being focused on like the next deadline. I think it just like varies a lot by person. Questions that I like have tried to ask myself and sometimes like suggested to other people they ask themselves is like, think about the sort of like things that they get out of their job that are important to them, that are like important to their well-being, that are important to like making sure that they like stay to the extent as possible out of spirally, horribly depressed zone and ask what is like the minimal viable project that will get you what you need. And when you're like depressed and like facing a rough patch, I think lowering your expectations of yourself and lowering others' expectations of you is basically something that you like owe the world. You like do need to actually, like, it's really hard to like look the thing in the face and admit that it's happening, but it just may be the case you can't do it. You used to be able to do. So like, I think it's just like actively very good to lower expectations, lower your responsibilities. That might mean like reducing your hours. It might mean quitting a job. And so thinking about like, what are like the most responsibilities I can possibly drop while still making sure that I have a sense of like meaning and structure. I think it's like one framing that I find useful. I think another framing is just like maximum viable project instead. And just saying like, look, I don't want to give up all the things that are like still getting me like meaning or joy or like structure or whatever in my life. And I put my whole life on pause for this just because it's a problem and sort of like, um, and it's also legitimate depending on like exactly what space you're in. I think it's a bad decision for some people to think about, okay, exactly how much can I keep my life the same while I'm still putting myself in a position where I'm like really confident I can meet all the expectations I'm setting for myself and I'm not going to do the thing where I feel like I left myself down and sort of like spiral from there. I guess like those are the types of things like I think about when I think about should you quit a job to focus on your mental health? And they're also, I guess, like practical careers situations. Having a blank on your resume sucks. Everybody already knows if I go and try and like apply an EA organization, so there's like nothing to explain. But like I'm afraid now exactly how I talked about it in an interview if someone's like, why weren't you working for this entire year? And so I think that there are like real costs to that. I think there are real costs to like losing your connection with like your employer. There's a health insurance thing. I think that there are a lot of reasons to like try to stay employed. And I think also a lot of people are surprised by like how important the structure of like, I need to be in a particular place every day actually is to them. One approach to treating depression is like a cognitive approach. It's like, how do I get my like thought patterns into a form where I'm like not constantly like hurting myself? Another is like the behavioral aspect. That's just like, how do I like, live my life in a way that enables me to like get my shit together. I think like on the behavioral side and like just creating space for you to like feel good again, often like having that like, okay, something's going wrong, but I still have like all the trappings of a normal life can just be like really important to people. Yeah. It was occurring to me that like when you're thinking about what could like constitute a minimal viable project or maximum, uh, it seems like once you're in like a particularly bad period, like this is a particularly bad time to be trying to work that out. So like, would you recommend that people try and think about this ahead of time? Maybe you now should be like, okay, if me, Howie in six months is going to have something that was similar to, you know, three years ago, what do I think I should actually do? What are the steps? And then if it actually happens and you're like, oh, fuck, here I am in this situation again, you just follow the steps that like past Howie set out for you. Yeah, that actually seems pretty good to me. I think that there are limitations in how much you can do that because you just don't know how bad future Howie's going to have it. And like, also, it's not just like a, like, you know, spectrum, like a scale. 
there's like many, many dimensions. And so you just like don't know like which abilities are like going to take a hit and like where the young fields are going to be. But having some kind of a plan on this front seems like pretty good to me. Having a plan for like what to do if you have a mental health crisis in general, especially for somebody who like has reason to think that this might happen to you sometime in your life. Which I think everybody has reason to think that. Some people have reason to think that it's particularly likely to happen to them. Like having a plan in general seems good. But yeah, having a plan for this in, per- in particular seems good. Also, I think asking another person who you trust to, who you trust and who like will feel to you like they're like on your side and making decisions according to like whatever criteria you would endorse, I think can be like really important for this. Yeah, I was, I was, I was just thinking like, even if your plan was just, I am going to email this person. That's my plan. That's what I do. Every time this happens, I email them, maybe even with just like a code word or something. It's like, all right, marmalade. This is just every time I say this, that's all you have to do. Just one word and they know. And then the process kicks off. That seems like quite good. I've at various times had things like that set up where it's like, if I send you a one sentence email that things are going to shit, I just like need you to call everybody, tell them what's going on, just like handle it. Yeah. And then I mean, like even for those first few days, like a potentially really bad period, if you knew that that was kind of being handled and now it was like, you don't actually have to tell anyone because this person's already taking care of it for you. That seems very helpful. Yeah. I mean, I think that like that probably would have been the difference between like losing a year of my life and my job and losing like a week or two of my life. So like, I don't know, like I like just can't encourage people more to like, it's amazing in these things where there are these feedback loops, how like little decisions and like little preparations that just cut out some of the tail events can just make a huge difference. Yeah. I mean, that seems worth, yeah, just pausing on for a second. Just this micro goal of just, if this is the one thing you do, yeah, if that could actually end up saving you 50 weeks of your life, like this is maybe the most cost-effective thing that you could ever do for yourself. It's just to set up this system. Maybe it takes you like, I don't know, a little bit of time to think about who the right person is and, you know, what's the threshold for like when you're actually going to send this email. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to like, in terms of practical advice, this seems like one that's unambiguously good. Yeah, yeah, I buy that. Yeah, and like, I think it is just like the difference between, oh, this person had a mental health episode and they like responsibly handled it by letting people know that they were about to start dropping some balls and then gave everybody a chance to like figure out how to handle it. And like, they didn't do that. Look, if you don't do that, I like couldn't have more compassion for you. I like didn't and couldn't have more empathy. And like, also a lot of people will feel that way too. And people, a lot of people will like get it. If you do do that, I think just like so many people are like, oh, I've had to like cover for people when like they get the flu. Yes, obviously go take care of yourself. This is like, and like the extent to which it like feels like this like embarrassing, shameful thing. Like the stigma there, I think it's just like so harmful because it just causes people to do uh to make decisions that are just like so much worse and if you like send an email to obviously people in different circumstances some people work at some corporation that's like faceless and you just can't do this that sucks if you are somewhere where you can do this and you send this email that's like i am worried i'm getting really depressed i might not be able to work for the next week can you please find a way to cover my stuff like i can't even tell you what the stuff is because like that's too stressful but like figure out somebody will know. If you do that and then it turns out you were wrong and the next day you're functional and you like show up and are like, hey, actually I can like go back and do my thing now. Everybody's just happy. And like, it wasn't a problem that you like did that. Maybe for a day you made people stressed out. So like leaning towards just giving people a heads up when things might be going wrong just seems like a huge win. Yeah. If you wrote that as like a template email, like exactly what you just wrote then. And then in these moments, the challenge was not that you had to write the email, like, you know, and then go over and like obsess over like if the wording's right and like whatever. Maybe that takes like days to actually like feel like comfortable with the text. If you instead just had to copy and paste something and all you had to do was just get, you know, the email address in and then click send, that seems like it's going to be probably more achievable. I mean, you can tell me. Yeah, I have at some point had that email written. I do not have an up to date one. I just think there's like a good prod for like actually doing that. I think it's a good idea. I mean, Personally, I can still imagine myself not doing the thing and just feeling so ashamed. But like anything you can do to like lower the barriers just seems really good. Okay, so one thing I want to talk about is that, yeah, I mean, we briefly covered this earlier, but like it's very apparent for anyone who knows you that you describe yourself very differently than the way everyone else would describe you and your achievements. What do you think is actually going on with this mismatch between your self-perception and how others perceive you? 
we talked about this with performance evaluations. When you hear all this positive stuff about you, do you intellectually think they're wrong? Or do you like accept that they're like probably right? And then it's just something that you can't internalize or what's happening there? That's a good question. It's actually pretty confusing to me. So it's like the area that I'm aware of where I'm most able to keep two entirely inconsistent beliefs in my head at the same time. And like, I don't know how you can believe both. So I like know what the right answers are in some sense. Or like, I know what the answers are that will get people to tell me that I am right. If someone asks me like, how good are you at X? But I like deeply believe the other thing. Yeah, I think one thing going on is that I am just really, really good at coming up with stories for like why any given thing that somebody told me I did was useful actually was not. And just like, will dig in my heels so hard. And I would not do this if it were about anybody else. But like, there's always, always, always like a story that like I can find. And like, I just like don't know how to describe why I'm like so desperately drawn to that. But like, it just feels like so true and so important to like dig my heels in on it. A lot of what I do at ADK is just like be available to give advice and like decision support to other members of the team. People tell me it's useful. In some sense, I like trust them. Like the people at ADK, they're my friends. They like me. They would hate to have to tell them to like give me bad news. They're also incredibly dedicated to like the mission of the organization, to the fact that like our mission is like, like we, I think we have like a, there's like a duty to like people in future generations to be like actually doing the shit that will like benefit them, even if it's hard. And like, if what I was doing was not useful, I really think that these are the types of people who would like, it'd be hard, but they would like, tell me. And like, people tell me that like, they find my strategy advice useful. I mean, if you pick any bit of advice, I will like come up with all of the ways in which me bringing up this particular critique caused X person and Y person to like spend hours of extra time investigating to make sure it wasn't a problem. And then meanwhile, like we came away afterwards and like, what did we flip from like 52% sure of one thing to like 52% sure of the other? Like there's a coin flip anyway. This is like always a story I can tell myself. Why am I doing this? I don't totally understand it. And like, the problem is I like actually believe it. That sort of makes sense to me for something that's like very specific, where someone says like, this bit of advice you gave me was really helpful. You can come up with a story. How do you feel about the fact that like, okay, so this is my like sincere belief. If I was polling the rest of the ADK team members and I was saying like, who would you be like most unhappy to lose from ADK? I would bet a lot of money that you would get like a tremendous amount of votes. People just genuinely do really value you. It's not something that they're just saying to your face. So it's like, they would all have to have just very poor judgment for that to be wrong. So like, how do you think about something like that? Yeah, well, that's very flattering. The- but true. I'm not trying to be flattering. Like, honestly, um, yeah. that's my, I whole, think- my, whole, my whole brand is to be honest. <laughs> that is your brand. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it's like hard to even give my reaction because I know it's like not the like right reaction. Right. But the thing that I think I actually believe and like, it's like, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, is just somehow there is this one skill that's like fooling other people into thinking <laughs> that you're smart and helpful. It's like happens to be orthogonal to everything else. So one could like <laughs> max out on that skill while being awful at literally all of the other things. And it turns out that like, you wouldn't think it, but just like, that's just like such a natural category that genetically or whatever, like you can just <laughs> be good at that. It doesn't require you to be smart in general. Like it's nothing, you just like have that just like nailed. And like, there is like a real sense in which like that is my like belief. It's like unreasonable. But, like that is my like felt answer to that is just like i'm fooling everyone i'm good at fooling everyone if you want to convince me otherwise let's go into each of the specifics and i'll just like dig in my heels and like there are a lot of like strengths that can like also be weaknesses and so i think that there's like i'm good at framing many of my strengths as also weaknesses yeah but i think i have like the imposter thing just like really really hard and yeah so i guess one place to go with this is like why do i have it i guess 
I don't really understand it. It just feels so true to me. It feels like it's like one of the things I just feel the most strongly. It's also the area where I can like most do the thing of taking a step back, being mindful about like what this Howie creature is saying and be like, that is not a person who is truth tracking. And like, if I were like, if I saw any other person making arguments like this, I would be like, obviously they were false. Like for whatever reason, it just does not make me think that the things are false. And I just like have very few experiences like this. Something's going on there. I think that I have a bit of a thing that's just like feeling terrified of thinking too highly of myself. There's some way in which that just feels to me. I don't endorse this, but it feels to me like the worst thing you could ever do. It's like, oh, you're one of those people who like thinks you're helping the world and you told people about it and like tried to get the credit for it. And like (laughs) you weren't doing it as much as you like. Like, You're just like done. Um, I wouldn't think about this. This is about anyone else who did this thing. But like if I were to do it, there's something that just feels so bad about overestimating yourself that I just feel like terrified of ever doing that. And then something about the like, I don't know, this is like sort of come up throughout this conversation and like, I like sort of gestured at it. But even before I read Peter Singer, when I was growing up, I was like a real Peter Singer guy. I was just like, look, I don't see any reason why it's better for me to have resources than like some other person who like needs them more. And the fact that like this isn't being handled is just horrifying. I was like very horrified at the world over this. And like, this was like just a major part of like how I saw the world growing up. And I think that this Peter Singerish impartiality type of thing, where it's like the thing that I actually endorse is like every person's well being is equally important, no matter like where they are, when they are, what species they are. Are they like a biological human? Are they like, like digital sentient? Like, it doesn't matter. It's equally important. And it's like, it's like a fundamental commitment of mine. And then there's this sense in which saying that like you're better than or something, anything, it like feels like it's abandoning that, even though it just like definitely is not. So I think it's like a bit of what's going on. I guess this is not the main thing. And then I think that's just like 40% of my brain devoted to finding mistakes that I made and finding arguments for why anything like good anybody says about me like must be wrong. And it's just always going. And I guess that that's just like the main thing. It's just like that. It's just always going. And it's like hard not to be convinced by it. I was going to ask, one thing that helps a lot of people is just if they're in a time when they're feeling like really bad about themselves is just to think what they would say to a friend who was saying exactly the same thing. Do you find like that is helpful at all to cut through some of the negative talk? Like if you're just like, okay, so if I came to you and I was saying, you know, whatever the last time you can remember is when you have really strong negative thoughts about yourself. If I was saying exactly the same thing, presumably you would have quite a different attitude. And does thinking about that help at all? It is a thing that I try to confront other people with all the time. (laughs) I see it being helpful for them. So I see the logic and it just doesn't. It's just like, well, like, yes, it would be unreasonable if they were doing it. But like, I'm just happen to be right. I just like, I'm the only person who's like right about how bad I am. And this has gotten worse over time by a lot. There's a weird thing going on that's like a type of double think where there's some sense which I'm portraying myself as like, look at how modest I am. And like, there's part of me that I think has some appeal in the like modesty thing. There's also a thing where like, some part of me has like an ego that's just like way, way outsized that needs to like chill the fuck out. And I do not understand how they like coexist. But like, if I actually believe I'm this terrible, then like my expectations for myself should not be very high. And like the things I expect of myself are just like way, way higher than that and probably unreasonably high and only would make sense if I'm like actually like a very talented, capable person who's like also in a lucky situation of being at a point of high leverage. But like, yeah, so those things are very inconsistent. I think that the thing that I'm actually doing is it feels like there are like very salient examples of Howie Prime that are like really nearby to who I actually am that are just like way better. So I think partly because I was just like being one of the first people at like a $10 billion foundation is really a life once in a lifetime opportunity. I think I just like was in a position to like do a ton of good. And like, I think I just still am sort of like 
mourning the fact that I like messed that up. That's a story. And it's like, I think writing an email would have basically prevented that from happening. Then there's like how he primes just like not mentally ill. And there are ways which you just can't separate who I am from like the mental illness. But there's like some sense in which it feels like that's a thought experiment you can do. Or at least Howie who feels a little bit less anxious. And like, I think it just opens up a ton of doors. And so it's really hard not to identify with that person who doesn't exist, but could. It's like sort of like the thing that I like ideally see myself as in some ways. And then ask what would be reasonable to expect of him. And then be upset that like, I'm not meeting that. We've been mentioning Ugfield a couple of times. Do you want to just give like a clear explanation of what that is? Yeah, or at least I will try. So it's this yeah. phenomenon that I think is very familiar to a lot of people that I guess, as far as I'm aware, was like first named in a less wrong post. Rob recently wrote a sort of like popular explainer of it. And the idea is that there's this phenomenon, a lot of people experience, where there's some task that you're supposed to do that maybe is a bit aversive, makes you want to procrastinate, but like is basically like a doable thing. And then you put it off and either you, I guess like the sort of like classic scenarios, you put it off, but like maybe you put it off. Maybe you like try it for like half an hour and have writer's block, but whatever it is, something happens so that this task that felt like a bit annoying starts to become just like really aversive. And the thing that happens is like, because it's aversive, maybe you spend, you like put it off for a day or two days or three days. And then like one classic example is like, it's like an email you're supposed to respond to. All of a sudden, you start feeling worse and worse about the fact that you haven't responded yet. And it's this sort of like terrible cycle where the worse you feel about not having responded, the harder it is to respond to the email. And the harder it is to respond to the email, the longer it's going to take you to do it. Um, and so you can just have these things that under normal circumstances would just be like, you could just do it quite easily. That all of a sudden, it takes just like everything that you have in you. It's like even trying to address it. So I don't know if people have like ever had this experience, but I think it's like pretty common that people have like some email that's like, that they feel guilty about not having responded to. It's like makes their whole inbox feel aversive. That's sort of like a classic example of it. But also like a paper that's overdue or like some work assignment where you know that you were supposed to have done your part of it a while ago or whatever. And they're sort of like particularly pernicious because of this sort of like self-reinforcing nature where like once they get going, it just gets harder and harder and harder to address them. And there's like a bunch of reasons for that. One of them is like, it may not have been a problem that you were a day late. Like sometimes it actually is kind of a problem that you're a week late. And so the thing that wasn't a problem that all of you got worried about, by getting worried about it, you like made it into a real problem. And now you're going to really worry about it. So that's like one possibility. Another is just like you build up to like negative reinforcement in your brain. This like terrible association with the thing. So if like every time you think about this thing for a week, you just feel panic. That's just going to get you like more and more associate panic with whatever the task is. So anyways, that is an Ugfield. I think of Ugfields as having been like potentially counterfactually responsible for like the worst parts of my life. So like I um, talked before about um, press episode I had when I was at Openville and like one framing on that is had like a bad incident, should have just like immediately emailed my boss and said, hey, they wouldn't let me on the flight. They were being unreasonable. I'm sorry, I'm going to miss this meeting. But that felt really aversive. And so I like waited until the next day. And like already at that point, it was just like, how did I like, literally my boss thought I was like successfully at a meeting in like a different country. And like, I was just hanging around feeling sad in bed. And like, he didn't know. That's like horrible. It's like entirely unacceptable, which like was not the case. It would have been fine. But like now it felt really hard to like even open my inbox. What if he had emailed me and like said what's going on? I heard that like the people in London didn't see you there. So I got like really scary. It sort of like just like spirals from there to the point where I'm going months without opening my inbox. I think that like a lot of people have much more minor versions of this, but I think it is like just a cause of a ton of suffering and actually does risk keeping people depressed or like making people depressed. I think it's just like super important to do something about this. Figuring out how to avoid them is really hard. A piece of advice that like I saw once, maybe in the anonymous advice content that we put out that I really like and I try to take to heart is like, if there is an email that you are avoiding and you realize that you are avoiding it, 
you're like not opening your inbox because it's there or just like taking any precautions to not look at it or you just like know that you're flinching every time you look at it, my opinion is it is often a good idea to treat that as immediately your top priority in your whole life. And like, it seems, it can like seem stupid because like you have some other urgent thing that is more important or whatever, but doing whatever it takes to like overcome that UG field today, it's going to take so much less effort than it will a week later when you feel like a week more bad about it. And like, I think that creating these things that you're avoiding is just like one of the best ways to be like self undermining and just like, just do things like really hurt yourself, including hurt yourself in like the medium term, like ways that really matter. So I don't know. I feel like I've just like been super harmed by this. And so have like this bit of like a life mission that's like, please don't do the thing that I did. And I think it's often surprising to people how little you have to do in order to get the UG fields cleared. So often the thing to do isn't even write the email, literally a like a one sentence email that's like, hey, I'm not going to get to this for a week. I'm sorry. Clears the whole thing. The person writes back and it's like, that's totally fine. And then you're like, you don't have to feel bad about it at all anymore. And like, nobody was ever upset. And like, that's literally all it takes. And yeah, I think it's just very easy to miss just like really quick, huge wins by like doing things like that. People understand that you're busy and just like letting them know, like this isn't going to come for a while. And giving yourself opportunities to see that the person on the other side of it almost never cares as much as you do. Seems like really important to me. So it seems like developing the skill of being able to like identify what could become an UG field seems like incredibly valuable. Like if you can just know at the time, like the first time you feel aversive, maybe even like you go to respond to an email and you just go like, ah, I don't want to do that right now. Even just that first moment. Yeah. Some sort of system where you're like, oh, I'm just going to actually like write down that that's in like whatever, like an UG field doc or something. We're just like, this is now on the list. <laughs> that seems like potentially really helpful. Yep. I've had a list before. I've like had friends who gave me their list so I could like check in with them oh, every good. day yeah. and be like, hey, like, did you get that thing done? Often you can ask someone else to do it for you. Your friend will have so much easier of a time writing that email than you will. And it's just like a huge win. So I think there are a lot of, there's like a lot of ways to, to get around these things. Yeah, I have that with my, with my fiance. I have a system basically set up where it's like, if anything's particularly aversive, like just the other person does it. And even if it would have been aversive for that person, if they were the ones who had a problem with it, it just automatically put them so much mm. easier. So like one yeah, example of this cool. was like, we were on a bus in Vietnam and we're just traveling and they just started playing this really loud music and we're like up the back next to the speaker and it was just whatever i was just like tired just for whatever reason they just like just really bothered me and i just was like i wish that they would turn this off and you know chloe was like oh like you just like asked them maybe and it's like i'm never gonna do that i'm never gonna <laughs> go to the bus i'm just gonna sit here for four hours and just like that sounds it. impossible it sounds impossible and even if she if she was the one who brought it up like it would have been impossible for her but the fact that it was me meant that like, oh, you can just go and do this. And the framing is that you get to be kind of like a hero for like this person you really care about. And it just changes everything. It's like, we do that like all the time where it's just like, yeah, anything comes up, like maybe it's like a phone call that you don't want to do or something. It's like, oh, just the other person can do it. And it's yeah. nothing. And it's actually a positive yeah. thing. Like you actually like, that's like a highlight of your day, potentially like saving this person from a really aversive task. People really like being able to help with this. Another piece of work-related advice around this that Rob came up with is I think it might be a really good idea for managers to ask their reports, like, do you have an UG field around anything today? And like, if you do it early enough and you make it clear that you're not upset about it, presumably if you aren't, obviously it's like a bit harder if you actually are, but if you can like cut it off really early, then just like you can assign it to someone else or you can make it clear, just, just by making it clear to them that you're okay with it, you might just like have made their ability to like do that projects like twice yeah. as fast or something. One thing that I know that you struggle with is excessive empathy. Do you want to like talk about that a bit? Oh, yeah. So I guess like when people around me, God, the phrase excessive yeah. empathy just feels like such a yeah. humble brag. I swear to God that I don't mean it as a <laughs> humble brag. Yeah. So I think when people around me get upset, I just like take it on. And I think often... I sort of like assume that they are feeling it several times. I think I'm usually right about what they are upset about, but like I assume that it's many times worse than it is. And I think I'm kind of doing like a typical minding thing of like, well, I get really sad really easily. So how would I feel if I was in that situation? 
And I think that this honestly causes real problems. So if people can tell that sharing bad news from their life with you is going to make you upset, they're just less likely to do it. They're less likely to like be able to lean on you for support. I think it's just like reasonable on their part, but like really sad, like not the thing that like I like want my empathy to be doing. It feels related to like some cluster of like mental health things I have going on. And yeah, just like counterproductive. I think the other thing that it does to me that I think I wish it didn't is it just makes it much. Yeah. So it makes it much more costly for me to give negative feedback to people or basically just to do anything that I think is going to like make someone I care about or even someone I don't care about sad or inconvenience them like at all. I'm just like willing to pay these like ridiculous trade-offs of like pay like 10 times the cost to like save one of my friends, like a 10th of the cost or whatever, which like they would not want me to do. And so one thing that that causes to happen is I think I just give, like there are times where I have like critical feedback for friends where I like think it would be helpful for them. I think I'm just like too unlikely to give them the feedback. So it's like, I'm thinking so hard at like how much I think it's like crush them. And like, actually, number one, they might endorse hearing it and just being crushed. And like, they ought to have that agency and like, they would be able to make that choice. And sometimes I know that like, that's what they would prefer. And then like number two, I'm probably overestimating how bad it would feel to them. Cause like, it'll feel bad, but like not as bad as it would feel for me, probably. And so I think one loss is they also have just like not tell people things when I like could be helpful and give them information they want. Another thing that it causes me to do at work, I think it's just like an actual real work problem that makes me less effective is I've gotten a bit better at, at this than I used to be. But for a long time, whenever I left comments on documents, which used to be one of my main jobs, I would just think really hard about how to make sure every one of them was like framed as nicely as possible. So I was going to the extent of I made a copy of the document for myself, made all the comments, went back through, made them all nice, then copied them onto the thing that was actually shared. And it just takes so much time and means that the people who want my help are getting less of my help because like I'm obsessing over like not doing anything that would make me feel bad that they feel bad. And then this may be less helpful too, because the watered down version is maybe like not going to get to the heart of it as much as the original would have. Yeah. I think I was like obsessive enough that usually I like right. found for like <laughs> okay. balance. So we've talked a bit about you sort of taking like a Peter Singer approach to things, feeling this moral obligation to like make the world substantially better for other people. And that that's formed like a very large part of your identity. Do you feel like you've successfully managed to tone that down a bit? Or like, do you endorse toning that down a bit? Yeah, it's a good question. I have really complicated feelings about that. And I think this like real instinct of holy shit, I have money that I'm spending on myself. And there are like people who need it or potential people who need it so much worse. Just like feels really core to me. And so, I mean, there's a long period of my life where I like was honestly counting the spending that I did on everything and like bed net equivalents. And I was like really feeling it. I like felt bad when I bought a plane ticket. There's like no like really direct way in which it sort of has like caused me to be depressed that I can like point towards. It's like unclear if the depression is causing that or if that is like, I endorse these beliefs really strongly. And like when I went to therapy for like, Howie, can you set more reasonable standards for yourself? I like made it very clear that this is not open to negotiation, but I can endorse those beliefs. And like, also that's different from like asking what standard should I be holding to my, myself to on like a day to day basis. And I have changed a lot on that front. Not as much as perhaps I ought to. I think a lot of my coworkers would like push me to change more, but like I have started to like sweat the small stuff about small amounts of spending eating out, getting delivery in a way that me of like five years ago, I think would be like, honestly, like kind of like horrified by. And I guess the way that I have thought about this is my ethical beliefs haven't changed. It still feels like if I think hard about it, it still feels like wrong in some sense when I do this, unless I can tell some sort of like crazy efficiency, like instrumental value story, but like it feels wrong. I think it is the right decision. I think that... For many types of people, doing the like act of constantly self-monitoring, where you're always asking, is that thing I have a desire for a little bit unethical? Is like that thing unethical? Like being in that just like 
frame and mode. It's like doing this like self-monitoring and like building this habit of self-criticism that I think for some people is very mentally unhealthy. And just like, even though I can't point to like a way in which it has definitely screwed me over, certainly seems like plausible to me that it is more likely that I will have another bad depressed episode if I like continue with that stuff. And like, that's actually really hard for me. And there's like a very long time where like, it both just felt so clear to me that like I ought to be like living frugally and like giving away as much as I could. And that I had like no like right to the money that just happened to be in my bank account because like my dad paid it to me. I felt like very core as like a commitment and also as like part of my identity. Like before I found EA, I was the only person any of my coworkers knew who was doing this thing. And so like sometimes I was like that guy. And so like was like a real big change for me. And I don't think I've totally successfully changed that way of thinking. But the way that I think about it is there is this really satisfying thing about feeling like all of your actions are like aligned with your like deepest core principles. And I like lost that and it's hard. And like, I sometimes do things where I'm like, I think I am doing a wrong thing. And I guess I think it's also good for the world that I have attempted to develop like a disposition that isn't constantly monitoring that because it like keeps me mentally healthier in expectation and like makes it more likely that I can sustainably do the bigger stuff. And the way that I've framed that, that has helped me to like find this acceptable at all is basically that like being able to do the thing that I used to do is just sort of like in some ways like a privilege. Being able to like have that feeling of like my whole life is like aligned in that way and some sense of like, I don't know, like moral purity or like whatever it was. I'm like judgmental towards it. And for people who can do that, I like, don't want to change it if it's right for you and if it's like working for you. But at least for like me, that was like a privilege that is clear that I just don't actually have. And like, I've let it now like to like run into the world, encounter the world, and it's clear that I am a person who's like a bit fragile and has to like take some steps to like, if I'm going to do good in the world, to like keep myself protected. And so I guess I sort of feel like I just owe it to the world to like do whatever I can to like not think obsessively in that way. And I think it's just right that this is a thing that's morally required of me. An attempt to like internalize that, that this is not me overall being selfish even if any of the individual naive, like, act consequences of it are, has been very important to me. And is a thing that I guess I recommend to anybody who, like, feels like they're, like, beating themselves up for this stuff or, like, has some sort of, like, a scrupulosity thing that is, like, either, like, putting your mental health at risk or just taking up energy that, like, should be going to, like, the ways of doing good that are, like, actually, you think are, like, the best way for you to contribute. I mean, this sort of strikes me as being tied up with a lot of the other things we're talking about, where, like, if you accept that, you know, an extra like 15 minutes of you like working at 80K is going to have a positive impact on the world and the 80K is doing like generally a good job and that you're like contributing to that, then like something along the lines of getting like food delivered. To me, it seems like even outside of the benefits to your mental health, it just seems correct to make a lot of those decisions to save you time. I'm wondering if like you actually you agree with that or like would you would you be like, OK, with, I don't know, other people at 80K cutting corners to save themselves time? even if you would have felt that like quiet, I don't know, horrifying when you were younger? Yeah, so I am certainly okay with people doing that. And I think that this is not the sort of thing where I want to be like monitoring anyone else's behavior. I think it's like a commitment of mine that feels important to me that I like not do that, at least like at that level of like granularity. So I certainly think it's like, okay, and people are like to make the trade-offs that make sense to them. I guess... If you're asking, is it sort of like effective from like a utilitarian perspective or something like that? It depends a lot on the specifics. I guess I feel like I was able to like do just fine on peanut butter and bagels or like beans and rice for like a really long time and set up systems where it was like quick and efficient. And so I don't think it really feels to me like there's some real tra- like time money trade-off here for me. There might be some more complicated thing of like, am I doing something that I'm like less excited about? And is that like wearing away over me over time? Some of this, that might be true for me, but other people that might just be like so boring that like they actually just can't tolerate it. Um, it's like not a reasonable expectation. And so for them, there really is this, should I spend money on like getting the takeout type of trade-off? And yeah, absolutely. Sometimes the benefit of the time is like absolutely worth the spending. It just like is tempting to make that argument even in times where it's not true. And it's just really hard to know when it's true. 
And then I guess I think even from that stuff, the main benefit is mostly from the attitude shift and not from the like, I saved 10 minutes of walking down the streets like at the bagel thing. But it's like the like laser focus on the thing that matters most and like not trying to like also optimize for like a billion other ways to do good that like seem okay. But like, I think there's just like a real benefit to like a sort of real laser focus on whatever you think is like the thing that you are doing and just sort of like having your head in that like a lot. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with ADHD? Like what does it feel like and how does it affect your life and how effective has the treatment been? Yeah, I find this a little bit hard to talk about because I think I don't feel like despite being diagnosed with it and despite thinking it like fits me very well, I don't feel like I really understand ADHD as like a category. And like, it's like an area where I particularly feel like I can like, I can, I can talk to my experiences with attention deficit or something. And maybe that's representative of other people who are like in this category. So yeah, I guess I was unusual in the sense that I was not diagnosed until like my mid twenties. And it's actually pretty hard to get diagnosed as an adult because all of the like infrastructure, the diagnostic infrastructure is like set up for kids. But it's actually kind of like shocking to me that nobody noticed anything earlier in my life. And I think it was just like, I was good at school. And so like, I was like getting grades that were like fine, just by like the like skin of my teeth. But like, I was like doing fine. And so like nobody noticed. But I guess my experience with it Yeah, so it's some combination of just like feeling like it takes a lot of effort to put my attention on anything that like isn't grabbing to me or like isn't interesting to me in like the right way or like something. I guess it feels like, I don't know any of the science, but it feels like dopamine receptors are just like really on overdrive. It's like all of the like addictive content notifications, pings type stuff, but also just like, Twitter, like reading Twitter, like new, just like new stimulation just feels like so tempting. And I'm like sitting and just writing out my own thoughts that I already have for other people. Like just feels like nothing is, nothing new is happening at me. And just feels like very hard to like stay on target. So I guess signs that could have been noticed when I was a kid are like, I in high school would show up to high school half an hour early every day. So I could do all of my homework for the day just like on the floor before class. So I was just like unable to get myself to do it at night. And it was like too boring to do. And so I was like terrified about the time pressure. I like wouldn't start papers until like midnight or like 2 a.m. the night before they were due. And I would like try or like, I would like sit around knowing that that's what I should be doing or like something. But I was like needed the deadline. I needed the adrenaline, basically. I just like couldn't motivate myself without adrenaline. And then like, there were just like these things that just like, I couldn't get myself to believe that they mattered, like sort of like administrative things. At one point, I like did my science homework every night for a quarter and printed it out, but just like never bothered to put it in my backpack and hand it in. Because it was like, well, I know that I like know the answers. Like, (laughs) what the hell is this like other part for? Um, So I was like a bit of a a mess. And so I just like eked through barely, basically because up until a certain point in time in life, all the assignments were like, fairly short and so like it was like at all possible to just like do it the night before I think like all of a sudden you get to like adult life and it's not like you're doing these like discrete projects you're just like I don't know my first job at Brookings I was like working on the same book for months and it's just like how much are you going to get done today on this book and like it can't be I'm gonna wait for three months and then have a day there and that starts like hit there when it was at its worst it was at the level of like When I was writing things and like successfully writing them and like getting enough done by working like tons of hours that like my bosses were happy. It was like good if I made it a sentence without flicking over to another tab and like getting some like stimulation. I think half a sentence might have been more likely. I would like know the whole sentence I wanted to write and then like typing it out just felt so boring to me. I was like, I'll do half of it and then come back to it. So yeah, I think like to the extent that anybody who's like hasn't experienced this can like get some sense of like the way it has felt to me when it's been sort of like at its worst. It's just like being really addicted to like a video game or like something like that. And just sort of experiencing just this like craving. It's like go back to the thing. And just like constantly having that pulling at you is like 
the way that I have experienced it. There are other things that like I do that like maybe are also in this cluster, but it's hard to tell. And having like now been treated for it, do you feel like it's made a significant difference? Yeah, so it's still like a thing that I struggle with on a day-to-day basis, in part because you like build tolerance to like the medication and like it like wears off towards the end of the day. But treatment for me has just been like a huge miracle, one of the biggest life improvements I've had. And so I don't know, for people who have like never tried Adderall or who are just curious, uh, or sort of stimulants in general, the way that I have experienced them is basically like there's this sense of like craving that I have for like more stimulation and more like novelty. And it just turns that off. And it makes me feel like satiated. And so it doesn't make me like necessarily focused on the thing I want to be doing or like any particular thing. But I just all of a sudden feel like I have agency over it. because it's like no pull. And it's like, oh, I could feel satisfied doing the thing that I intend to do. Or I could like feel satisfied reading the New York Times. Well, like this is very easy. I know like I want to be doing the thing I intend to do. I think that that's just sort of the effect that it has had on me, which is like a huge difference in like productivity and like the frequency with which I like get myself into trouble by procrastinating and then get really anxious and get myself into a hole. So one of the biggest mental health risks for me is like that spiraling dynamic and just been like an incredible way to like limit the number of times that that comes up. So what has the pandemic been like for you in terms of uh, anxiety and depression? I was actually very worried about this when it started to become clear that there was going to be a lockdown. I have in some ways been incredibly like lucky. My partner lives in New York. I live here in London. She's a school teacher. Her work became remote. So she was able to be here for like five and a half months, which was just incredible for me. And when I wasn't like lonely during the pandemic and like, it's like the, we don't usually get to like be in the same place for that long. So that was like a huge, just like very lucky there. And that affected my experience a lot. A thing that I struggled with is having the team in one place is like very motivating for me. Or as a whole, not about the whole team being in one place, like having a sufficiently sized cluster of people who I feel like these are like the people I'm like going to war with. So like whatever, I want their project to succeed and I'm like helping them feels important to me. And I'm also just like socially anxious and like some mix of like introverted, but also like social context is like really important to me. And so getting that automatically through work is like really important to me because I'm unlikely to like actually reach out and like make it happen actively. Yeah. So I think like there's like a bit of a loss there. So I had like a pretty rough patch for like a month or so where I like had trouble getting some work done, did like a bit of like an Uggfield thing. And I think being out of the office, being out of my routine just like made it more likely and made it like harder to like come back from it. So I had a rough patch, but like for the most part, I think having my partner in town meant that there were some ways in which it just like luckily was much better for me. I don't know how I've lucked out in this, but I like have very little health anxiety for whatever reason I was like spared. So wasn't anxious in that way. There's like some sense of like, even though I'm like shy and like, honestly, like just like very scared of strangers, seeing them feels very important because it makes me feel like I'm like in the world in some sense and not just in some like bubble. I think that that's gotten me like a bit down and like feel like a bit lonely because of that. And then a bunch of the things that I do to like blow off steam or to like make sure that even when I'm in like a rough patch at work or like there's something rough going on socially or like, I don't know, I'm like going to be working on a thing that makes me anxious for like a week or two. I think it's like really nice to have like a thing I am looking forward to where it's like there will be an end and there'll be a thing that I know will like make me happy and let me blow off steam. For me, a lot of that is seeing music. Like being able to like go out and like see punk music is just important to my like happiness. Or it's like one of the ways I've found where it's like, even if I'm in a bad mood, this will like give me like an hour or two where I'm like, can like leave that away and like keep that at the door and like just be like in the moment. And I think like losing that has actually been like pretty tough and like gets tougher over time. Do you think you have any like broad tips for like anyone else who's really struggling i mean obviously they can't specifically ask their partner to come by for like five months just for like even people who have potentially never had or like consciously thought of themselves as being anxious or depressed obviously that's like showed up a lot like do you have any thoughts on how people can best get through this period so i said i'm not sure it's just like a really unusual situation and like i think a lot of things that people like are making people like down are just reasonable things to be down about 
like not being able to see people that you really care about, it sucks. And like, I think it's like really useful to look for reframings that don't make you feel that way. But like, also it just like is tough. And so I don't feel like I have like great suggestions here. I guess one thing that's going on, as you mentioned, is I think there might be some people who are like experiencing anxiety or low mood or like down in a way that they haven't really experienced before. At least like I've seen some numbers saying that like anxiety in like certain populations is just like way up. And I worry that there is generally a thing that's like something to do with stigma and something to do with just like how we think about mental health and mental illness, where like people feel like they shouldn't get mental health treatment because like, it's like, I feel bad or I feel anxious, but I'm not like mentally ill. I'm just like stressed and I'm not anxious. I'm like burnt out, but I'm not depressed. There's like all this like type of thing where it's like, I am not one of the people. Um, and also there's like a sense that like, if you go get treatment, if you see a therapist, it's in certain communities. I think this just varies a lot by country, by like sub-community. Uh, but it's like, if I go see a therapist, now I'm deciding I'm like mentally ill. And like, that's just like a big, scary sounding word. And so I don't know, there's like probably a lot of people who are like experiencing these things for like the first time or like at least like more frequently than they usually do. And I guess like I would love to encourage an attitude that's like the point is to make you feel better. The point isn't whether or not these like fairly arbitrary diagnostic criteria happen to cover you in particular. If there's like a set of feelings or behaviors or emotional reactions to things that like you would like to change. And there are like tools from therapy to help you change it. It doesn't have to change your identity or your like image if you don't want to. And like, it just may be the case that you don't meet the criteria for like generalized anxiety disorder or like whatever. But if you were like noticing ways in which like you are suffering or just like could be better off, the value in finding out if this stuff helps, I think is like so high. And I don't know, it just like doesn't, require you to like answer all these thorny questions about like am i really depressed yeah that's great do you feel happy to like share your main mental health related goals at the moment with the audience what would you most want to improve at the moment yeah so one type of answer is i probably should have more thought through plan for improving my mental health i think it's like feel like i've like tried a bunch of stuff and feel like a bit exhausted from it and like it's very tempted to go into a mode where it's like, I'm 34. I like have tried a lot of things. It's like how it's going to be. I think that's the wrong decision, but I definitely like fall back into that. That said, I have been working on a couple of things. One of them is I'm just like trying really hard to exercise more frequently, which I think is just like clearly one of the best things I can do for my mood. And I also find so hard to stick with. I will have months of my life where I can run every day. Although I think I may have now gotten old enough where like, that's like no longer healthy and I get injured too much from doing that. But like, if it feels like a choice at all, there are just like always reasons why it's the like wrong time. There's always like, oh shit, I'm actually being really productive right now at work. I'm not going to like stop that to like go do this. Like, uh, so just like never urgent. We have a optional at the office Slack channel. It's a daily check-in Slack channel where you can list your goals for the day and then like cross them off if you do them. And like, it's a bit of like a, both to encourage you to plan and to encourage sort of like accountability, just like if you would find it useful to like have the team sort of like see it. It's like very informal, but I started doing that as sort of like a productivity slash mental health type of experiment. So one of the things on there, it's like, did I exercise today? And so it has been, I've been exercising more in the last month than I had in the last couple of years. So it has been a success in that sense, but still not where I would like, like it to be. So that's been one thing. I think it's just one of the best things I can do for my mental health. And one of like the bigger life mistakes I'm probably making is like not actually making that happen. And then the other thing that I've been working on is like, I think just like a constant drain on me that I just like don't feel successful at work and don't even know how I would go about doing it. And just I'm really able to tell stories about like every one of my days, about like how it was like, I prioritized the wrong things. Like it wasn't useful or like whatever. And so I've been like trying to work really hard at, I think this is like due to like pretty deep parts of my psychology and like actually a pretty hard try- thing to change, but like starting to do experiments with different things that are like, can I come up with a way to lay out goals for days such that they are meetable? You would know if you met them and I will feel like I did a at least acceptable job for the day if I've like successfully done those things. 
So yeah, posting on this daily check-in channel is at least an attempt to move in that direction. I have not yet found, honestly, the balance between making sure that they're actually meetable and like making sure that if I accomplish them all, I will actually feel good at the end of the day. But I'm like working on it. And like one of my coworkers, Brenton, has been meeting with me once a week to sort of like encourage me to do this kind of thing and like help me brainstorm ways to like move in this direction. I feel really lucky to have coworkers who are like helpful with this kind of thing. Have you had a day in like the last month, say, where you've ended that day feeling satisfied, like you were genuinely happy with your progress that day? Yeah, in the last month, I probably have had three or four days that felt that way. All days where the whole day was like dominated by one particular task or like meetings such that I could just tell myself like, this is the one, like this day is only about this one particular thing and has a beginning and an end. And if you like do it, then the day has been done. Unfortunately, like work doesn't always look like that. Kind of like this. Yeah. So like, this actually is the type of thing where it's like, I will successfully talk for the period of time that we are talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, uh, so like I will have done work hours and I will be really working during them. So I find it easier to feel like I like did the thing that I set out to do in those circumstances. I haven't found a solution really for like other ones. Let's make sure that we cover as much advice as you feel comfortable giving out with the caveat that neither of us are psychologists or psychiatrists or qualified in any real way. Um, (laughs) But do you have any, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess we talked about this a little bit, but do you have any like broad recommendations for people in the audience who might identify with a lot of the things you've been talking about? Like if they haven't seeked any help yet, do you have any like advice for our first step, like a micro goal? Uh, That's a really good question. I think the right micro goal depends a lot on the person. So one possible goal is, do you have a friend who will help you make sure that like something happens? And I have like done this for several friends where it's maybe I like make the list of therapists and tell them in which order to call them. Or like maybe it's teach them a bit about like the options for antidepressants. So like they can just like make one appointment with a doctor and like tell them what their preference is. Or like maybe it's just start doing like 10 minutes of exercise, like a couple of days. Like I think it just depends a lot on the person. But asking a friend, I think can be a good way. Like they will know, they'll be able to help you figure out. So like, what is your bottleneck? And like, what is like a really minimal thing that you also feel comfortable with, but that can like sort of get you on a path? Yeah, I really like, um, just on the exercise one, I really like in our podcast with AJ Jacobs, he talked about micro goals and one of them was for exercise and that not just say like, I'm going to try and do 10 minutes of exercise because even that could be like a bit intimidating and not even to say like, I'm going to do one minute on a treadmill, but to just put on your shoes, like just put on your running shoes. That's it. Yeah, That's like the goal. That. And once you put on the shoes, there's like a fairly good chance that you'll like get on the treadmill, even if it's just for a minute. And once you're on for a minute, you'll probably do two. And that just seems to be like a really effective way of doing it. That does seem really good. Um, I guess like look up the website of a therapist is at least one micro goal along those lines. Yep, that's very good. In part, we're doing this conversation to try and make it obvious that more people are struggling with this than they might think. Yeah, do you have any like tips on how someone might actually internalize that? I guess I will like make a pitch that's just like, I promise you it's the case. Um, So um, take it or leave it. I think that I have tried to be pretty open about the fact that I have mental illness, including like within the EA community, I've like shared a list of like somewhat vetted therapists in the Bay Area that's like been passed around a lot, which means that like people who are like depressed sometimes reach out. And then also means like people have reached out to me to be like, are you okay? I have this too. And so like, I can promise you that at major EA organizations, I'm not like the person with mental illness. Something that's like striking about like the way in which it's affected me, but like there are a lot of people who are like experiencing this in some way or another is like not, at least in like the communities I am a part of, there's like not much stigma around getting therapy. It's like more likely if I tell, much more likely if I tell someone that like looking for a new therapist, that they will suggest theirs and (laughs) and then they will be like, oh, like, I don't know about that therapy thing. So because this is a thing that has like a lot of stigma, it's just really, really easy to underestimate how many people around you are struggling with this on like a day-to-day level. And like, if you open up to someone, it's like, ah, can't make any promises. And like, 
you might be in a very different community and subculture or just country from where I am. And like, you know, like you should take that into account. But it's like reasonably likely that like they or someone in their family, someone that they know has been like seriously affected by this. And yeah, hopefully that like can do something like reduce the the fear and stigma a bit. Looking up the numbers, if you can find them, I don't have them offhand, of people who are using psychiatric medications in your country, or if possible, in like an even sort of like more individualized region, I think might be one thing. A really large percentage of people are taking antidepressants. And like, it's very unlikely that's the case that none of them are the people around you. Yeah, that's a really good point. Do you want to like give a pitch for like just how important you think it is for people to seek out treatment? Yeah. So I think it can be really hard to do, especially because a lot of the treatments are things that have a big effect for like 20% of people or have like a small effect for like 40% of people. And it takes weeks. and It's like unclear to you until those weeks are done, whether or not it's helping. So like, I think I have a lot of reasons where it can be really hard to like get motivated. And so I think there are like some ways in which it's just incredibly valuable that it's just easy to lose track of. So in particular, especially if you're like young, but even if you're middle-aged, the value of trying treatments and finding out if they are useful for you, the information value there is just so, so high. If it turns out that you try SSRIs for like three months or six months and they're not helpful, that does suck. It's like a pain to take a pill every day. If you like don't wean really slowly, like the withdrawal can like be shitty. Like there, there are sometimes side effects. But like, if it turns out that it's useful to you, you maybe found a thing that for like years and years and years is going to like make you happier or like less anxious and like potentially just solve one of the biggest bottlenecks in your life. Same with therapy. It can be awkward to like have a therapist that you don't like. And it's like a lot of time. And I don't think therapy is right for everyone because it does take a lot of time. It can be disruptive. But like, if you think that maybe you should try therapy, I think it's very likely that you should try therapy. For this reason, like maybe you go and you find out that spending a year in therapy gives you the tools that you need to like not be depressed anymore, or just that having weekly therapy in general for like years just makes your life way better. And you can like save all of your worrying for like that hour in the week. And learning that then gives you just like this huge tool that will make you like way more productive and happier just like for the rest of your life. So like, I can't make any promises that will help. But like finding out just seems like incredibly valuable. Howie here. I mentioned SSRIs a bunch. So I want to also flag that Wellbutrin is a different medication that can be a reasonable first option. Some people with anxiety find it makes that worse. Although that hasn't been my experience. On the other hand, I think a lot of people find it has fewer side effects for them than SSRIs. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a thing that some folks might want to try. And then I wanted to mention that depression can also have nutritional causes like anemia or vitamin B deficiency. And this might be especially a risk for people who don't eat meat. So since these are pretty easily fixed, getting some blood work to check for iron or vitamin deficiencies might be another really good first step if you think you might be depressed. Okay, back to the recording. Do you want to just say a little something about how important it is to sort out very basic things like diet, exercise, and sleep? Like the kind of things that people always say are like so important, but it might be hard to actually... I don't know, like quite internalized, just how important it is? Yeah, I guess I have mixed feelings about this. I think it is incredibly important to get those things right. And often those things can have effect sizes that are just enormous relative to like even some of like the best medications out there relative to like, like getting your sleep cycle into like a reasonable place or starting to exercise every day. I think the effects can just be like, like, that's just, like, all you have to do often. Like, that could be the whole issue. And so it's just a huge win. I think that this is the conventional wisdom. I think exercise is, like, one of the best things you can do for depression and anxiety. And, like, if you feel like you can give it a try, it should be probably one of the first things that you try. I do worry that there's a bit of sort of moralizing around this and a bit of, like, ideology around this, where it's, like, the ideal thing to do is to, like, fix it yourself by like shaping up and like living the right kind of life and like being like a real adult who's responsible and like has like the right patterns. And like, if you have to have a crutch of getting treatment, fine. But like, it's like unvirtuous if you don't like fix this stuff up first. 
And I just like detest that. If there are things out there that could be helpful to people, this is like a horrible reason to keep keep it away from people. And often if you're feeling mentally ill, getting your diet and exercise and sleep in the right place is just a really big ask. And honestly, if you're not, like it's one of the biggest New Year's Day memes, at least in the US, is like everybody gets their gym membership and the gyms are busy for like a couple of weeks and then they're empty again. It is really hard to like get yourself to like, or it might be easy. I don't want to say it's hard for everybody. Like you should find out if it's easy for you. It can be really hard. And like, there is no need to like do the really hard thing that tons of people find really hard before you try and see if things that you might find easier actually be the trick for you. Do you have a view on how valuable therapy can be in comparison to getting the right medication? Do you think if if someone was focusing on one thing over the other, do you have like a sort of intuitions on which way they should lean? Yeah, I guess I have opinions on this that are sort of a bit similar to my opinions on the diet, exercise, and sleep thing. So I am now out of date on the evidence on therapy and antidepressants. But my sense is that the evidence is vaguely that they have a reasonably similar effect size. I imagine for some people, it's much bigger on one than the other. Some therapists are probably way better than others. Some medications probably are better than others, even though I think the science hasn't done a great job of like showing which those are. But I think that there is, again, a sort of like ideology or like a moralizing thing or something that says that you should try therapy first. And like the virtuous thing to do is to like figure out the fundamental psychological root of like what you are doing to like cause your depression or like what thought patterns are doing it or something like that. And medications are like a crutch and like the cheaty like cop out option. And I just think that's like wrong and horseshit. Like for some people, that is what they need. And it can be like fulfilling to like understand yourself better in addition to like it being helpful. And so like, by all means, I think people should try both. Cause like, if you learn which one works better for you, that's like a huge win. But like, there is no shame in trying medication first, if that's right for you. And in particular, therapy requires spending an hour a week going to see a therapist who like, depending on your health insurance, where you live, might be expensive. You have to like have time in your day for it. It's like costly to do that every week for like long periods of time. And taking antidepressants requires swallowing a pill once a day. And if they are equally useful, there is like no shame in deciding to do the thing that is way less costly. It's like, I'm really not like an advocate for either of the two. I think that there are like things that you can get out of therapy that you can't get out of like taking medication. But I do just like want to push back on this thing of like, you like need to try therapy first, especially because a lot of people just can't do therapy. You might have a job that just means that like you can't take the hour off from work to go do it. And I just like wouldn't want that to hold someone up from seeing if other things might help them. Or you might have kids where it's just like makes it like yep. really hard. Good point. Cool. Are there any specific resources that we could point listeners to in the show notes that you want, you could like name check now without just like reading out a list of URLs? Yeah. So I guess I'm just not an expert on this and was more up to date on the literature like 10 years ago than I am now. But some things that I would recommend are number one, Kate Donovan, who's a therapist who was not a therapist when she wrote this set of blog posts for the great blog posts, wrote a guide to getting a therapist. Just like how to get started on doing that. I think it just be like really overwhelming. There's like so many different practitioners with like varying amounts of information about them that are like using varying t- techniques. And so um, I just like really, it's the best thing I know of on like how to find a therapist. And I think that that's like a big barrier. And if you're having trouble weeding through that morass, having your friend read the blog post and then like give you a list to call that might work too. So yeah, I'd recommend that. The blog Slate Star Codex has two posts that are like things that sometimes work if you have anxiety and things that sometimes help if you're depressed. And I would recommend both of those as like a like reasonably comprehensive list of the fairly standard set of things that people try and some of the evidence behind them. I have like some disagreements with like some of the research there, but I don't know, I like wouldn't treat it as it's a blog post. It's not like a peer reviewed review of the literature. But I think it's just like incredibly valuable to just like have tons of interventions and links in one place. So I recommend that. And then there's a book that I got a lot out of 10 years ago. I don't remember it well enough to know if like, there's like some stuff in there that I totally disagree with now. And it's also obviously out of date at this point, but there's a book 
by a psychologist named Peter Kramer called Against Depression. And one of the main things he's trying to do in this book is he identifies this meme, sort of like archetype, that he calls heroic melancholy, and tries really hard to argue that you should not get tempted by this vision of like depression as like heroic in some way, that like it is probably like not necessary for you to like be creative or like you can have many of the same, you can have like basically all the same thoughts, but also not have a fog following you around and like slowing you down all the time. And for me, I think that the heroic melancholy thing has some pull as like an aesthetic. I think there are some things about the world that make me feel sad, that make me like identify with other people who are like seeing it as it is and are like appropriately upset about it. I think that there might be a lot of people, especially in the effective altruism community, who have like some amount of that going on and some amount of like, I should feel guilty. The depression is like good for me because it's like motivating me to like, at least I went through some of that. And so I found it really helpful to have a book that's particularly pushing against that. So we will list that in the show notes. I think a problem that a lot of EAs have is just inability to set standards for themselves that they can possibly meet. I think that there's just this sort of like maximizing, optimizing type of attitude that can just make it really tempting to like shoot for the stars and then like not actually have a plan that could like possibly lead you to be successful. And I have found and people I've recommended it to have found this book that's like CBT for perfectionism. It's called Overcoming Perfectionism to be really useful on that front. And I think in particular, there are a lot of people who like aren't sort of like stereotypical perfectionists. I think in a lot of ways I'm not, in some ways I am. But I think would find it really useful because they're still doing this thing of like sort of setting unmeetable standards. It can be hard to tell if your standard is reasonable, but like just the thing of asking, can you imagine successfully doing the thing that you're setting as like your criteria for success? And like, if you can, it might still be too high, who knows? But if not, like you need a new one. The standard of like, do the most good. You will never do the most good. And like, if that's the thing, you are not going to like feel successful. And there's some temptation to like do something like that. And I think it, this can be useful for people for whom that is difficult. And I guess we'll also just like, uh, there's some really good compelling memoirs of people who have had mental illness. And so we will post a few of those up on the show notes and possibly also some short fiction that I have found is like among the best descriptions I've seen of like the internal experience of certain forms of mental illness, which I just thought some people might find interesting, especially if they haven't experienced it before and just like want to know what's, what it sounds like in like a certain set of people's heads. That's great. Yeah, we'll put all those up in the show notes. We have sort of touched on this throughout the conversation that the EA community, the effective altruism community has been unusually supportive was there anything else you want to say about just what your experience has been like being part of this community? Yeah, I will preface this again with I'm super lucky to like have been put in a position where like people in the community know me well and like I've been around for a long time. But it's just incredible how much support I have gotten from like people just like welcoming me back when I like uh, was better enough for me depressed to like show my face again, including people whose lives I like made really difficult for a while. And so from that, it's like people offering me like a place to sleep to like people like reaching out just like with support or to like say that they've been there too. So that sort of things. I had multiple EA organizations who are like interested in potentially working with me and hiring me, even though they have like full knowledge of like how he's got some real problems and some like real weaknesses and they like do affect work. And so I think it like speaks well of like, organizations to the extent that they are right that I could be like helpful despite you know some like the limitations um it speaks well that they were able to like think about that reasonably and not just sort of like get stuck on the stigma um I think there might be some perception or I can imagine there being some perception that you should hide it if you have these types of problems and at least I can say like there's like a proof of concept or something like an existence proof that it is like not going to be like an absolute bar on getting jobs at most many EA organizations. And then my experience being accommodated at work has been like just really incredible. I'm just really lucky to have it. So like everything from like my boss deciding that like, it seems like I started finding something aversive. Let's just pass it off to like someone else to like working really hard to experiment with lots of different roles to like 
see what functions best with my combination of like things I want to work on, like desire to do something leveraged and also just like anxiety about like a lot of the things that might be most impactful to like, I sometimes like miss a day because I'm like down or I like slept really badly and like having that be okay as long as I like handle it responsibly to like, sometimes I like when I'm setting priorities, I'm just like down enough on my ability to actually successfully complete anything that I like cannot do it. And I have just like sometimes told Rob that he just needs to pick for me. Like I can't, it'd be really good if I could be like an accurate judge of what I will and won't be successful for. If I can't, being able to pass that off and just being able to like be honest about that has been like hugely beneficial to me. And then I can't really speak for other people's experiences, but I think that there are like a bunch of other people who just like feel similarly accommodated. And there's like obviously like a like trade off in like a line here. And I really, really, really hope that if it became the case that like I had enough limitations that like I really wasn't able to contribute, that the organization would like notice and we would talk about it and we would find something else for me to do. But I feel like really lucky about the way that I've been like uh, my experience so far. Yeah. I mean, I, I can just say that personally, the fact that it has been so welcoming for you makes me much happier to be part of the community too. Like it just like reflects so well on it without actually having these experiences myself. I don't know. There's like a so- source of pride in being around people who are very caring and sensible about this, even as you say, when they are, you know, so focused on doing the most good. And you can imagine that they could have been ruthless about this, but actually they're just incredibly lovely people. Yeah. Um, something that I felt very touched by that somebody did that they absolutely did not have to. When I was sort of like at the like depths of my depression and just starting to be able to like look at the internet again, somebody who I had met once and did not know well at all pulled message to me to say like, look, I've heard things aren't going so hot. Like using ketamine as an antidepressant is sort of just like on the path to being approved by the FDA has been like a miracle for some people. If you want to like talk about it, I'm happy to like talk about it. Sent me some information and was like, if other stuff isn't working, um, you might want to give it a try. And I thought that was just like so kind to do for someone who you like don't even know and didn't even ask for your help. And ketamine is now approved by the FDA as an antidepressant, although it's like a bit hard to access and very expensive to get from an actual infusion clinic. But I have now been using it as an antidepressant and for me, it seemed just like enormous effects. And so I don't know, having somebody like reach out and nudge me towards trying this thing that I had been like meaning to try and like just wasn't getting to just like made my life a lot better. And so I don't know, I just find like stuff like that where like person didn't have to do anything to be like really moving. Yeah, it's amazing. So just to wrap up, I thought it'd be cool to ask, what is one of your happiest moments of your life so far? Yeah, so one thing that brought me great joy was I'm some a total sucker for animals, for dogs especially, especially really big dogs, and also a sucker for like people getting emotional when it feels like it like runs counter to type and like you wouldn't expect it. Um, so I had this incredible experience years ago, back when I was living in Brooklyn, where I ran across a bunch of kids who were all kind of like hanging out with this just like enormous part boxer, part pit bull, like enormous dog. Um, they like, came over and was like, hey, like, what are you guys up to? And the kids just all bolt. So that's just like me and this dog hanging out. And um, they don't know what to do with it. Seems like he's probably lost. Um, I think that they were just like looking for an excuse to pass it off to anybody else. So end up having to like take care of this dog for the night. Some really nice woman lets me borrow a leash because I'm just like sitting there holding his collar. It's like probably weighs like three times as much as me, not knowing what to do. So I end up taking this dog for the night, take the dog home. It was my first night in a new sublet. And I hadn't met my roommate yet. So my roommate comes home at like one in the morning, brings somebody back to the house. The dog is just so excited to see them. They are not as excited to see the dog. I get kicked out of the house. So I spend from like 2 a.m. until 7 in the morning just getting like dragged around the streets of Brooklyn by this like dog that I have no ability to control whatsoever. And then finally... I managed to find a vet's office that's like open at seven in the morning or whatever. Um, They're able to like look up the microchip and like call a dog's person. And this dude comes over to the vet 
And he's this like enormous guy, it's like a shaved head, this like biker looking dude. He sees his like huge dog who then runs over and just like so like jumps up on him. And the dude starts bawling, just like breaks down in tears and starts crying. Um, and something about seeing like a big bald biker dude uh, crying over his like big enormous dog. I think like uh, I think it was like optimized. So like the type of thing that like really gets me personally going. So I found that incredibly charming. That is a wonderful story. All right. Well, I think this has been fantastic. You're such a delight, Howie. Thank you so much for doing this. No problem. Good chatting, Karen. If you got something out of that episode, it would be great if you could share it with anyone you know who might also find it valuable. If you struggle with any of the issues covered in the episode uh, or know someone else who does, uh, you should check out the list of mental health resources that we've compiled in the associated blog post. And uh, as I said in the intro, uh, if you're feeling suicidal or have thoughts of harming yourself right now, there are suicide hotlines at National Suicide Prevention Lifeline in the United States and Samaritans in the United Kingdom. Uh, you can find links and phone numbers to those in the show notes for this episode. If you live in the UK, uh, we also just wanted to point out that things are potentially a bit easier there uh, than described in the US. Uh, the National Health Service will cover the cost of medication uh, and some therapy. So listeners who are eligible should contact their GP if they're having mental health challenges. Uh, and they can then potentially get free medication and free therapy through the IAPT program. Alternatively, you can self-refer through IAPT. Uh, and there's a link for that in the blog post as well. Finally, uh, two extra resources that weren't mentioned in this episode. The website that Howie couldn't remember the name of uh, that gives you coupons for discounted prescription drugs if you're in the US is goodrx.com. Uh, I can definitely recommend that. I've, uh, I've used it myself. And since the recording, uh, Scott Alexander has launched a new practice, Lorian Psychiatry, uh, which includes a considerable and growing number uh, of detailed explanatory pieces addressing different aspects of mental health and treatment. Uh, you can find that at laurianpsych.com. We know that many of our listeners have mental health challenges uh, or have loved ones who do. Uh, so we are planning to produce more mental health content on this show and on the 80,000 Hours website in future. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced and in this case also hosted by Kieran Harris. Audio mastering is by Ben Cordell. Full transcripts are available on our website and made by Sophia Davis-Fogel. Thanks for joining. Talk to you again soon.